Good evening, folks. Uh, welcome to another MBO Imaging live stream. Uh, last couple of times I did this, I've had some technical problems, but I think I've gotten everything solved and sorted out this time. Um, what you're seeing on screen, though, is a very minor technical problem that I've had. I had set up a camera outside pointing at the telescope so that we could watch it move while I'm uh, going from target to target. But um, unfortunately, the camera lens has already viewed up uh, in the last 20 minutes since I got it set up. You can see what it was supposed to look like from the thumbnail that was up before this stream went live. But unfortunately now, as you can see, it's very foggy. But that's okay. That's not going to affect our imaging and it's not going to get in the way of getting some photos. So we've got, uh, wow, 183 people here already. Fantastic. Welcome. Um, I am going to be watching the comments as well as I can. Um, I can even do some cool things like putting people on screen. G'day, Shell. Thank you for coming. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, leave them in the in the com comments, pardon me, and I'll try and get to them. Uh, I can't make promises, though, because I am going to be concentrating most on doing imaging and stuff. So if I miss your questions, I'm sorry about that. I'll try and get back to them later after the stream has finished, and I'll answer the comments in uh, Facebook. But uh, if I see any cool ones on, on screen, I will... Um, I'll answer them as I go. And uh, Kylie, you are absolutely correct. It is quite cold out there. Part of the reason why is because there's no clouds, and that's that's good. That's what we want. No clouds means more stars. Although there were a few clouds passing by here and there, but uh, if we're lucky, we'll uh, we'll be able to avoid those. All right. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll come back to this camera angle the next time we move. But uh, I've already got it lined up on an object, and I'll show you where we're pointed. So this is in Stellarium, which is a fantastic free uh, planetarium software. And I use this to help find objects and point the telescope in the right place. Um, I'm just going to check messages because I had one come through and I never know what uh, might be important. OK, yep, I can check that out later. Um, so yeah, I um, use this to help me find the objects I want and let me know where the telescope's pointing. This round circle here is a rough indicator of the field of view of the telescope, and if I zoom out, you can sort of see that's showing where in the sky I'm pointing. So over here is the South Celestial Pole. It's a little bit laggy on this. South Celestial Pole here, and that's uh, the object we're going to look at called 47 Tucane. So the, the um, Stellarium thinks that it's pointing there, and I've confirmed that already by um, looking at the camera. Uh, but let's just go double check that, and uh, let's start with getting an image. So this software I'm using to control all the cameras that are connected out there at the moment. So I'm going to change over to the imaging camera. And I am going to choose a profile, which lets me get uh, decent quality images. So what I do in this case is it's going to do about 15 second exposures. And you can see down the bottom right here, we've got a little progress bar. Uh, that will then download the photo, and it'll appear here on the left in this area that's currently black. Uh, and we should see our first object in just a few seconds. There we go. So what we're looking at here is a globular cluster. Uh, that's a cluster of, and in this case, hundreds of thousands of stars. Um, they all orbit each other, and they're outside the Milky Way galaxy, but orbiting the galaxy. So this is what one 15-second exposure looks like. What I'm going to do is a, a process called stacking, and I'm going to do a live stack. And what that does is it takes uh, a whole bunch of photos and it aligns them all together. Oh, Aki's made his first appearance. Hey, buddy. His tail might appear on camera in a second. Um, Aki's my cat, if you're new here. Um, it takes a whole bunch of images. It joins them together and averages out the noise, the grain, and adds up the signal between each of them. So it lets me get a much better view of that object. Uh, so while it collects a little bit of um, data, I'm going to check the comments and see if there's any questions I can answer. Wow, we've already got a heap of people in. Fantastic. 207 people. That's wonderful. Okay. Um, oh, Hiker's here. Fantastic. Thank you for coming out and helping, Hiker. You were a wonderful help in previous uh, streams, so it's great to have you back. Uh, you can see Hiker there. So that's what her icon looks like. If you see that, that's uh, someone from MBO. Uh, one of my dear friends, Justine, has been able to join. Thank you for coming, Justine. I enjoyed watching your stream just an hour ago. So it was nice to have your company while I was setting up. Um, Shell Paul says, my family and I are loving these live streams. Thank you so much. 
I'm glad you're enjoying them. It's a lot of fun for me to do as well. Uh, it, it's great to be able to share my excitement for astrophotography in the night sky. Uh, let's see. Any questions? What's the name of the software? Um, the, there's a, a, a variety of software that I'm using, but the, the stuff that I'm using to control the camera uh, and capture this data is called SharpCap Pro. Uh, you might be able to see the, the lettering up there in the top corner. Let me just turn off my, uh, my screen so that you can see the whole thing. It might make it a little bit bigger and a little bit easier to see. SharpCap Pro. Um, it is free, but I'm using the Pro version, which uh, includes this live stack feature. I don't know if that's in the free version, um, but it, it, it uh, is fantastic for outreach like this. Um, there's a bunch of other software that I use in the background, and I'll um, mention that when I get to it. Um, I mentioned previously the Planetarium software I was using is called Stellarium. Uh, that one's also free on desktop. It's uh, on mobile as well, but it costs a little bit more, but it's, it's really fantastic. Um, so we've got uh, now nine frames stacked here. I'm just going to bring my camera back because I like having eye contact with folks while I'm, I'm doing this. Hello again. Um, so we've got nine frames stacked. That means the grain and the noise is able to um, sort of blur a little bit more. And that means I can now play a little bit with these uh, the histogram. Oh, I need to turn off the banner that says stream starting soon because it started. There we go. Um, so I just need to move my cat out of the way. He's sitting right in front of me and I can't reach my keyboard. Thank you, buddy. Um, so down the bottom here, this is called a histogram. And a histogram photographers will be familiar with, but it's basically a graph representing the distribution of pixels in the image. So the horizontal bar or the horizontal axis is the brightness of the pixels. So up this end are dark pixels, up this end are bright pixels, and the vertical axis shows how many there are. So you can see from these peaks here that there's an awful lot of very dark pixels, and that's probably the background. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag this um, black marker up past that area, and that will darken the background. So now we've got a nice dark sky. We don't wanna go too far though, because it will um, cause us to lose some of the fainter stars. And you know what? That, that peak wasn't actually background, that was stars. Now you might also notice that it's red, I'll fix that in a moment, but let's just tweak the mid levels a bit to brighten things up. It's a little laggy because I'm controlling this. What you're seeing here is my laptop, which is connected to the telescope outside and I'm connecting to it by uh, network screen sharing. So it slows things down a little bit. Um, so what I can do now is I can click this button here. So these vertical bars are relating to the color. And this is an auto color balance based on star color. So if I click that, it usually does a pretty good job of evening things out. And there we go, much better. So let's zoom in and have a look at this at a larger size. So that's at 100%. Now you can see that the stars aren't perfectly sharp and perfectly round. That's something I can, uh, I can have a go at fixing, but you can see there from that image that there are a lot of stars there. Uh, 47 Tacano is a quite a dense cluster. It's one of the bigger globular clusters in the night sky. Um, I don't know if you can see uh, in the background, let me just try tweaking these settings a little bit. Um, yeah, there we go. It's blowing out the center here, but look at the background here. See all these little dots? That isn't noise. Those are actual stars. Let me zoom in a bit, zoom in a bit more for you. So we'll come out to the right here. So you see all these specks, all these dots. Not the green one, but all these other dots, they're all stars. So there is a heck of a lot of stars in that uh, globular cluster. The green here is um, a, a, what's called a hot pixel. It's a point on the camera sensor where it um, over samples or over reads the, the data. It, it collects more data than actually is there. It's just a flaw in the manufacturing. Um, and so it registers it as being very bright and it's in one of the green sub pixels within the, the matrix of color pixels on the sensor. And so it's only the green one, so we get a green spot. You might see um, in other images later, um, blue spots and red spots. So we'll go back out to 100%. And I'm gonna let that accumulate data for a little bit. It's still already looking great, but I'm also gonna have a look at some of your questions and see if there's anything I can help you with. So let's see. Oh, quite a lot already, this is great. Let me scroll back and catch up. What is the name of the software you're using? It's free. Yes, as I mentioned, uh, Shopcat Pro, it is free. 
um, we've uh, paid for extra features. Chris Cook, love your work, such dedication. Thank you very much. It is a lot of work. Um, this has taken me years to get to the point where I can get this working. And those of you who joined us in the previous streams, you'll be uh, aware how much um, we struggle with technical problems. Uh, yeah, thank you, Janelle. I didn't see the uh, the banner on screen until uh, a few minutes later. <laughs> uh, Pam, yes, I think Pam, you've been here before and you, you like my cat. <laughs> I'm sure he'll make another appearance soon. Uh, Janelle, thank you for becoming a member of MBO. That is fantastic. We really appreciate the support. Uh, MBO is a completely volunteer organization. Everyone who is involved does it for the love of it. Um, we don't have any source of income from uh, like other than what our members can find and provide. So memberships, donations, uh, purchases of our uh, merchandise and government grants is how we keep ourselves going. So um, if you want to support us, the very best way to do that is to become a member. And you can do that by going to our website, mbo.org.au slash membership. And um, with that, you can get access to all the things that membership brings. You can see that on the web website, but uh, also uh, lots of cool content as well. We have um, weekly members nights, and at the moment we're doing them all online, and they've been very popular. We've had some fantastic speakers uh, come and, and talk to us uh, on our members nights. Um, let's see, what else have we got? uh could be in for another late night <laughs> quite possibly uh, those of you who've been before know that i like to go on for a while here it's fun there's no reason not to keep going as long as everyone's still enjoying themselves ever since your first live stream my four-year-old daughter insists we go out every night to spot jupiter and saturn oh that's wonderful i'm glad she's become excited about the night sky um, jupiter and saturn are very beautiful uh, there's a whole lot more to the night sky than jupiter and saturn but um, that's something that she can look forward to exploring as she grows older and um, gets more interested in space and science. Uh, Teresa says, hi from down the road in Pakenham. Hello. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our Napanen Observatory is located in the Dandenong Ranges uh, in the far east of Melbourne, um, near Cockatoo, which is actually where I live. Cockatoo is my uh, hometown currently. so. I'm very fortunate to be able to share some of the same good skies that MBO has. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Janelle, you'll have to stay dirty for a little while. <laughs> uh, it keeps, um, the whenever I get to the bottom of my screen scrolling, it jumps to the bottom of all comments. So I have to scroll back and find where I was, which is a little bit frustrating. Um, so I, I may miss some of your comments uh, because of that. Um, let's see. Um, Peter, who is a fellow astrophotographer and MBO member and committee member actually, asked how long I'll be on for tonight. At least an hour, probably two and maybe three, uh, going by my past experiences. How many light years away are those stars from our galaxy? Well, let's go to Stellarium and we'll zoom in on 47 to Carnet. Uh, this is a little laggy because as I said, I'm controlling this uh, from my laptop outside. It's a, a good laptop. Those of you who recall that I was running on a, an old laptop before, um, this is my new laptop that I've finally configured now. Um, so this is working, but it's the, the connection to, um, on, to the to the laptop via the network and sharing the screen that uh, makes it a little bit slow. So the object 47 to Kane distance is uh, 15,300 light years. That's a long way. Uh, our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So this one is outside of the plane of the Milky Way, but it's relatively close to us in that, you know, that's, um, scheme of things, um, but it is a, not a close object. 15,000 light years is a long way by anyone's measure. Um, I'll come back to some more questions shortly, but let's have a look at how our image is going. So we've got 43 frames stacked, which is 
terrific. That's a, a good number to, um, to do some processing. So let me just tweak these a little bit. I want to darken the background a little bit, but see if we can make these stars a little bit more visible as well. Okay, that's good. And bring up the mid-levels. And bring down the darks again. Not quite that much. It's looking a little bit blue too. Let me try that star calibration again. No. All right, how about auto? Does that do any better job? Ah, much better. Yes. Maybe a little bit too yellow. I'll boost the blue a smidge. So this isn't editing the data. It's just changing how it displays. I just heard another message come through, so I better check. Okay, um, Peter has informed me that he has an occultation event tonight at 11, which is amazing. Uh, what occultations are is when a, um, a solar system object, most often a, um, an asteroid, passes in front of a star. And what happens is that the star's light dims as the, um, the asteroid eclipses it effectively. And by doing that, if you know the precise location that you're, you're viewing from and the precise time at which the light changes, you can actually determine a lot of things about the asteroid, including its distance, its size, and the speed it's moving. That's especially useful if you can get a whole bunch of people observing it at the same time. So if we're still going by 11, which I think is a good chance, I'll um, see if we can invite Peter into the stream and he can share his screen and we can watch some real live science happening in action which is really exciting. So thank you for letting me know about that, Peter. Um, let's go back to the stream chat. Um, oh, I'm well behind on comments. Uh, yes, thank you, Belinda. You were there for the whole time too, so I appreciate that. Okay, it looks like my connection to the remote uh, remote laptop has died. So I am just going to need to close that and start it again. I'll only be a second. And there we go, we're back. So let me just share my screen again. And there we go. Okay, so um, now I've noticed that these stars aren't perfect shapes. That's what happens with uh, the telescope's drive. It's not a, a research grade drive. It's got a few little flaws in it and that makes it sort of bounce around a little bit. But I use a technology called uh, guiding and that's a second telescope sitting on the back of the first one. And it lets me um, watch a particular star and follow that star throughout the course of the night. And it does that in such a way that I can uh, keep those minor tremors in the telescope's drive um, from affecting it and hopefully make the stars sharper. So let's have a look and see if we can see stuff. Okay, I need to change the, uh, the settings here. We'll change that to three seconds. Uh, I had it changed, I uh, had it differently before because I was uh, experimenting with getting a better focus on this because I had nudged this and the focus wasn't quite off, wasn't quite on. So you can see here, we've got a small lower resolution picture of the globular cluster there. Well, what I do is I tell the software to pick a star. It analyzes the stars in the scene and says, okay, this one is a good one to use as a guide star. I then tell it to start guiding. Uh, okay, I haven't calibrated this for a while. So I actually haven't calibrated this at all. That means I need to do this calibration first. So. This isn't a technical issue, but it is probably something I should address. And it's probably interesting for you to uh, learn a little bit about it. So to do this, I need to move my telescope to a uh, position closer to the celestial equator. And then I'm on a calibration routine on the, um, the guide scope. So let's do that first. Now, there are some tools built in here that um, actually, no, I won't use those tools in case things get out of sync. I will slew to the celestial equator in the Stellarium. That way I know that I'm gonna be pointing uh, correctly in uh, both ways. So in both pieces of software. So let's see, the celestial equator is uh, this line here. 
So let's head out to this star. That might be a good place to do it. So choose the current object is where I want to point the telescope to. Click slew. Actually, just before the, I do that, I'm going to save. I'm going to save this. Uh, lag, come on. Uh, don't we all love lag? Oh, it's really spiking at the moment. All right, hopefully it'll catch up in a second. There we go. So I'll save that. Stop the live stack. Change the camera over to the external camera, the one that's watching the scope. Let's see how bad it is for you at the moment. Oh, it's still laggy. Oh, wrong camera. Okay, that's better. And we'll change the profile to the live video profile and zoom back out to auto. Ah. Didn't load the profile. I selected it, but didn't load it. Oh, man. <laughs> that is way... Um, way overexposed with the uh, the dew. This light here is a tiny little LED on a USB connection that, um, that is totally blown out because of the uh, because of the dew. But let's go over here and we'll see if we can still see the telescope moving. Watch the counter weight down here. You might be able to see that move. There it goes. And while we're slowing, let me see what other messages I've got. Okay. Oh, cool. There haven't been too many, so I've caught up. Uh, yes, thank you those to those folks who are jumping in and answering questions that I'm unable to get to while I'm busy. Uh, you can see the telescope now pointed over the other direction, which is great. Um, yeah, it's uh, it takes a lot of concentration to do this sort of stuff, so uh, it really helps to have people helping out. All right, so let's see if that stars in the field of view. And we'll go back to the, we'll go to a, a live uh, view for the imaging camera to just get a better idea of where we're pointing. And that looks like it's the star we wanted. So I, what am I, what am I doing? Oh yes, I'm doing the calibration. So there it is. Uh, so we'll go to tools. Modify calibration and we'll clear calibration data and we will do it again. Uh, maybe I need to click on calibration down here. Do I have to select a star first? It's been a while since I've done this. All right. Guide tools. Hmm, where is the calibration? Maybe if I just start guiding, that will be, it'll pop a, a request to calibrate. No? Oh, yes, there it is. It's doing the calibration. So it's going uh, west. It'll move the telescope west in small steps and it'll watch where the star moves to uh, relative to the crosshairs and then it'll go um, back to east again then it'll go north and then back south again and you want a perfectly l-shaped calibration for that to be uh, correct so let's have a look at questions again uh, adrian any chance we can look at mars saturn or jupiter we can look at saturn jupiter and the moon tonight but mars doesn't get above my local horizon until quite a bit later so I apologize, I can't show you that, but we'll definitely have a look at the others. They're always popular. Okay, um, Gabrielle, hi, thanks for sharing all this with us. I've loved astronomy since childhood and would love to learn astrophotography. Can you provide any information or recommendations on where and how to start? I'm keen to get a new telescope. It would be great to hear from you, from, from you at some point. Okay, so there is a lot... Uh, involved in getting a telescope um 
our um, director of astronomy at MBO, Jackie, is um, currently planning a, uh, a talk to happen in one of our future uh, Night at the Observatory monthly streams, hopefully this one, which is coming up soon, um, but if not, then soon after. Um, so she will be able to give you the best advice on what telescope to buy. However, for astrophotography, I'd actually recommend you start out with just a digital SLR or a mirrorless camera or something equivalent and a tripod. And that will teach you the basics of astrophotography, how things work, and will uh, give you a good head start um, to doing telescopic astrophotography. There's, um, I did a lecture at uh, MBO a few years ago on this topic about getting started with astrophotography. And I had that, or I recorded it myself, and it's up on my YouTube channel. So if you go to uh, YouTube and search for Neil Creek Astrophotography, you should be able to find the link to that tutorial there. It's uh, called Easy Astrophotography. And um, as happened in the previous time I did this, um, some uh, wonderful little uh, elf went off and found the link for me and posted it in the, in the chat. So um, we might be able to, uh, they might be able to help us out with that. Uh, let's see. Okay, it's done its west steps and it's now returning back east again. So that's good. Uh, okay, so let's look at the latest comments. Last session, I spoke of NGC 253. Um, quite possibly. Let me go and find that in my uh, library of objects I want to see. 253, uh, the Sculptor Galaxy. Yes, that should be possible. I will have a look at that perhaps after we've done the calibration. Uh, it's a, a beautiful object too. Uh, Uranus and Pluto is a question from Janelle. Um, I think Uranus is up. It's uh, Uranus and Pluto are both very, very faint. Um, Pluto is far, far fainter than uh, Uranus. So it's um, hard to pick it out from the background of stars. Um, you can't just take a photo and go, oh, there it is. You need to look up star charts and see what's not there. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, um, they just look like brightly colored dots, stars, essentially. You don't see a disk on those unless you've got a very powerful telescope. Um, probably not worth us having a look at tonight. Uh, Paul gave me a tip holding shift while pressing the guide button. Yeah, I think that might be what uh, what triggered it for me in the end. Uh, Jack would like to know, how old is the moon? Not much younger than the Earth. Um, the solar system all formed at around the same time uh, with all the gas and dust that was accumulating uh, around the, the gravitational field of the sun. Uh, the Earth was among many um, uh, planetoids, uh, planetesimals, perhaps you could call them, uh, when the, uh, the very early stages of the solar system was forming, and many of those were colliding with each other. Uh, the current best theory is that a planetesimal about the size of Mars hit the embryonic Earth uh, and smashed it, and the material that got thrown up from that massive collision eventually coalesced to become the moon. So the thing that was going to become the earth had been around for a bit longer. And the thing that smashed into the earth uh, was around about the same age, but the moon was formed as a result of the material that was thrown up from the, um, the combination of both of them. Obviously because Mars is much bigger than the moon, not all of that material from that impact went into the moon. It was only a portion of it and a portion of the stuff that was making up the earth became the moon. Um, that was one of the interesting things that the Apollo mission found when they brought back rocks, um, that the composition was very, very similar to that of Earth. And it was um, that discovery which led to this impact theory uh, of the formation of the moon. So the moon or the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, which is the age of the solar system. The moon is probably only a few tens or hundreds of millions of years younger than that. Uh, tens or hundreds of millions of years may sound like a long time, but it's not really in the age of the solar system. Okay, let's see. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. We think we are fantastic too. <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of wonderful people up there and uh, I've made some amazing friends. So it's, it's great to have those folks uh, around. Uh, so if you want to become with us, part of us, then I think you'll enjoy yourself there.
Is it possible to put comments at the bottom right of the page as we can hardly see you with a vision of what you're presenting? Thank you. Uh, I don't think so. Um, the software I'm using is called StreamYard and it's designed to be um, very easy to use and um, have little complexity. So there are fewer options to um, change the layout of things. Um, that, so yeah, there is a bit of a problem then when the comments hide uh, what I'm doing, but uh, I'm trying to remove the comments when I'm uh, doing something of interest. Uh, sorry about forgetting to remove that banner earlier on. Uh, Kelly has very kindly shared a link to my uh, online photo um, gallery. Uh, this has photos from things other than my astrophotography. Um, and just be uh, aware that if uh, nudity is something that concerns you, uh, there is art nude photography on that website. So stay away from the nude gallery if that's uh, of concern to you. But otherwise, uh, I'd love for you to explore my uh, gallery and, and uh, enjoy my work. Okay. All right, I um, have probably answered all the questions I want to answer for now. Some of them are good, but I, I um, will probably need a bit more time to answer them properly. The calibration has nearly finished. We've gone through our west, east and north stages and we're now doing our south stage. So it should catch up very soon. Let's see how bad the dew is on the camera out there. Uh, it keeps hiding that control panel. Oh, there we go. I need to pin it. I must have clicked on that accidentally before. All right, I'll get the live video and load the preset. Okay, yeah, that's a lot of dew. <laughs> I wonder if we uh, make it a little bit brighter if we'll be able to see more. Oh, yeah, that's a little better. Um, maybe I can increase the contrast on the histogram stretch. Let's see what that looks like. That's a little bit. Okay, we can roughly see the telescope there. I have a dew heater that uh, heats the lens up and stops dew from forming on it. But I'm using it on my guide scope at the moment, which is on what I'm using to, um, well, we'll be using when it's finished calibrating uh, to track the uh, the stars to make sure they're pointing the same direction. You can see that's it here, sitting on the, the piggyback in the back of the telescope. So I've got on here a dew strap, which heats up the lens but I've only got one of those. I need to get myself a second one so that I can put it on the camera that is watching the telescope. Justine, oh, just missed that one. Going very smoothly tonight. It is, Donna. Yes, I put in a lot of work over the last week to get things sorted. Uh, but Justine asks, how cold is it over there? Let's see what Google tells me. Uh, I'm in cockatoo. Uh, so what is the current temperature? What is the current temperature? See if you can hear it. Oh, it's not going to read out aloud. Okay. It's five, five degrees. Uh, can you see it on the screen? Five degrees. So it's rather cold and I'm running the heater in my office um, on and off. So yeah, that's keeping me a bit warmer. Uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't know that. I must have un accidentally uh, unplugged my laptop out there. So... I'm going to have to go out there and fix that. So while I am, I'm going to take out a lens cloth and just uh, wipe the dew off the, the camera. It will form back on pretty quickly, but um, it's you know something I can do. I'll be right back.
Yep, as I expected, I accidentally kicked the power cord out of the power block. What a difference it makes just wiping the uh, the lens. Hey, it looks so much better. It won't stay that way for long, though. How's the calibration going? Done. All right. Let me just have a look at the calibration results. Uh, tools, review calibration data. Okay, that's mostly good. But the declination has got a bit of an issue there. I uh, might need to look into that later on and see what's going on because that should come back on the same line. Oh, well, never mind. I'm calibrated now, which means I can guide, which means I should get sharper stars. So let's go off to that Galaxy uh, 253. So I'll do that. And while I'm getting some images of that, I will uh, answer some more questions. So Stellarium, we go NGC 253. NGC 2553. Okay. Current object. Slew to it. And let's watch the telescope move. Uh, if the lag will let me click on it. There we go. Uh, it's getting bright now because the side with the LED on it is coming around. So let me turn down that setting a little bit. That's a bit better. This out to the left here is my laptop screen. All right, so we'll go back to the other camera and we'll see if we can see 253. Uh, I keep forgetting to click load. Yep, there it is. You may not, you may not be able to see much, it may not look like much, but um, there is a galaxy there. So it was a little bit off center. So let me center that and then I will synchronize the uh, pointing with the telescope. So the next time it goes to another target, it'll be even more in the middle. There we go. All right, so turn off the crosshairs, go back to Stellarium and tell it to synchronize with that. How much better is that, guys? Remember the last couple of times I spent ages looking for these things? Ah, finally working. It's good when it works. All right, so we'll go to the imaging preset and we'll go straight into a live stack. Now, the guiding is going on at the moment. And it's not too bad. Generally, I like to keep it between this dashed line and this dashed line. But um, oh, it's gone way off there because I was slewing then. So I'm going to clear that. Uh, yeah, I need to find another star. I keep forgetting to turn off the guiding before I slew to a new target. I'll do that all night, I promise you. <laughs> Uh, and now it'll guide on that star while I'm doing this imaging. All right, there we go. There's our first frame. You can see there's definitely a galaxy there, isn't it? So let's just do a quick auto stretch of the uh, the exposure and color balance. Now, this is something that's uh, really going to improve with some extra time spent on it. So I am going to let this run for a little while. And while I do, let's zoom in a little bit, I will uh, check your questions, check your comments. So just remember what this looks like now. Look at all that grain in the background there. That should reduce in time. So we'll see how we go. All right. Uh, Naomi, Alex would like to know how big a black hole is. Well, it can be any size, really. Um, Theoretically, there are black holes that are smaller than pinheads, micro black holes. Um, they were often formed, I believe, during the Big Bang. Um, there may be other processes that can form them. But um, the majority of black holes are uh, maybe the size of Melbourne uh, in diameter uh, and you know up to the size of Victoria, that sort of diameter of their um, event horizon. But there can be also supermassive black holes, which um, are inside the middle of very um, of most galaxies. And the first one that was imaged, which was uh, in the news a little while ago, 
that one was uh, about the size of the solar system out to Saturn. So the radius of the, of the um, black hole was the distance from the sun to Saturn, which is just mind bogglingly huge. It was the biggest black hole ever, uh, I think ever discovered up to this point. So uh, they can be of a huge variety of sizes. Uh, it's done that thing again where it scrolled all the way to the bottom. Uh, there's a lot more comments coming in. That's cool. Justine, you are right. <laughs> and I went out there in my T-shirt. See, I'm wearing a T-shirt. <laughs> I like being in a T-shirt. So when I'm indoors, it's nice. Uh, thank you, Sharon, I think. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> What a difference a white makes. Yes, indeed. Let's go. Um, oh, I can't swap cameras in this software while I'm imaging. It has to be between targets. So we'll go back and have a look and see how bad the dew has become. My kids, uh, in my kids' room, multitasking, viewing plus putting the kids to bed. Parents are amazing. Uh, the, the multitasking you can do is just phenomenal. Well done. <laughs> Oh, wow, Kelly, I am jealous. Well done. Uh, if you get into astronomy seriously, maybe you can build yourself a little observatory up there. That would be wonderful. You know what would be great um, would be to have some background music here. I need to figure out how I can stream background music into uh, st uh, StreamYard and uh, not get done for copyright infringement too. So I'll have to do some research on that. Uh, Jackie at Mount Burnett uh, has a suggestion for 47 to Carne. And yes, that is an excellent suggestion. Although um, we did start out on that. Uh, yeah, so that is such a good suggestion, Jackie. I've already beaten you to it. <laughs> I just remembered that we've been there already. Um, but we'll go back maybe a little bit later on tonight for those folks that weren't here at the start. Uh, but for now, I think we'll um, we'll hop around a few other targets first. Uh, Vita asks, can we zoom into the moon? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I was thinking of going to the moon next. Um, the images I'm going to be getting of these faint galaxies and nebulae tonight aren't quite as good as they could be because the moon is up and it's quite bright tonight. So there's going to be more noise and uh, more haze or lower contrast in the photos that I can get uh, because the moon acts like a, a natural source of light pollution. It tends to drown things out a little bit. Um, but of course, that means that we can then look at the moon. So that is a great thing in itself. The moon is a beautiful sight. Um, we've got five minutes on this one. I might play with the processing on this a little bit just to see how much uh, better I can make it look. And I'll zoom in a little bit on that. Uh, I've got some rather bad vignetting going on there. I need to do a, a flat calibration to correct for that. But since we're only looking at the target in the middle here, that's not so bad. So yeah, that's very hazy sky there. Oop, don't want to go too dark. Mm, yeah, this is an object that really needs a lot of data to look good. You can see, even though I've managed to darken the background a bit, there's still a lot of noise in there. There's also a, a green tint. Let me see if I can use the auto white balance for stars to see if that helps. No, that's too blue. So we'll go to a um, auto white balance in general, just looking at the image. Okay, does the same thing. All right, so let's do some manual tweaks. Oop. Okay, that's not going the way I want it to. Let's reset that. Oh, very peak. I wonder why. Maybe because of the moonlight is corrupting it. Okay, that's better. I think it had to be reset before I could get the right color from the auto. Um, it's still a little green, but uh, you can really see we've got a nice galaxy coming up here. 
Uh, you can see you've got the, the brighter core in the middle there. You can see it's definitely got a spiral shape to it with these sort of wispy arms coming out. And you can see lots and lots of sort of mottled dark areas, and those are gas clouds. So the, the universe, when it was formed, was full of dust and gas and, you know, basic atoms. Over time, they coalesced into stars and eventually galaxies, but there was a heck of a lot of dust and gas left behind um, from the formation of the universe and since then from the deaths of stars. So we can see an awful lot of that stuff here in this galaxy, which is blocking the light from the stars behind it. And we can also see that in the Milky Way itself when we look up at the night sky on a, on a clear night um, in a dark sky away from the city. You can see it's not just a smooth river of white or, or river of light. It's got these dark patches all throughout it, and that's dust and gas blocking the light from the stars behind. So let's go for a few more minutes while I catch up on comics. Oh, this is really annoying how I get to the bottom of one screen and it just jumps all the way to the bottom of the comments. Okay, caught back up where we were. Emily, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of stuff going on that's uh, not ideal at the moment. So getting our heads in the stars is a, a nice relief. It really helps you to, to get away from that for a little while. Uh, Tommy, any reason I'm using SharpCap over Sequence Generator Pro? Uh, yes. <coughs> um, SharpCap is ideal for uh, this kind of live imaging sort of outreach stuff. Uh, the two main features that I like most about it are that it lets you do live stacking, which um, SGP does not. So you can't build up an image over time. And um, I'm shooting with a, a one-shot color camera here. And... SGP uh, does the debayer process. So it turns the black and white um, image with the different color matrices with the Bayer filter into a color image on the spot. So rather than having black and white images, which is all I can get from SGP, I get color. So I find this to be a better solution for outreach. Uh, MBO has always been about community. Online gives us huge reach and we are loving it. Absolutely true. Uh, we are a community observatory first. Uh, if, uh, if there's a choice for us between um, something that's good for astronomy and something that's good for the community, we'll pick the community first. But uh, we like it best when things are good for both. The things we do for astrophotography. <laughs> I don't want to patronize, but you have no idea. <laughs> I've been through all sorts of trials and tribulations to, to get to the point where I can demonstrate this stuff. So it's very challenging, but very rewarding, as I'm sure you can see. You get to uh, enjoy the spoils of my hard work here. So thank you for coming by and watching, everyone. Okay, a question about white holes. Um, they're theoretical, and I think they might be fantastical, so sort of a science fiction invention rather than a, uh, a real uh, existing object. I'm not exactly sure what a definition of a white hole would be. Um, I've heard of things called naked singularities, which are black holes. Um, black holes are a point of infinite density, in an infinitely small space. So they have no dimension. Uh, the thing that makes them a black hole is the fact that there's a distance from which you get from them that light can't escape. A naked singularity is supposed to be a, a black hole, but that doesn't have an event horizon. So the, the curvature of space time, rather than being a, a funnel going down towards a black hole, is just a, a pinprick, a hole. Um, that's not theoretically possible, I don't think. And I think white holes are something similar. They're meant to be like if black holes are one end of a wormhole, which is theoretical and not proven, then white holes are the other end where the energy that, that gets sucked into a black hole comes back out again. But that doesn't really match up with any of the theories of um, the way the universe works that we currently have. I think it's a, mostly an invention of, of science fiction, but I would love to be proven wrong if um, someone can find a resource that... Uh, 
describes the like a paper or a journal article describing what a white hole is and how it works i'd be thrilled to to learn about that uh ben says that it's cloudy in melbourne well let's have a look at the Mount Benin Observatory All Sky Camera. Because I live just down the road from MBO, uh, I can use their All Sky Camera as a proxy for me. And it's looking pretty good at the moment. That bright, bright thing in the middle that you can see there is the moon. Um, but I can't see any clouds around there. Um, maybe there's a little down here. Uh, that's out towards the, uh, the east. So Melbourne's out this way. So. Fortunately, I'm in a gap at the moment. <clears throat> Let's have a quick look at the satellite. Um, a small laptop screen has my bookmarks over several pages. So this is the current satellite view. And it looks pretty good at the moment. So uh, you might just be unlucky at the moment, Ben. But um, uh, let's hope it stays over you or... Uh, nowhere else over me at least so i can do this in the meantime okay um yes Zach, i agree the galaxy is starting to look good seeing structure let's go back and yeah you could you can see that the contrast on that has improved quite quite a bit in fact i might even be able to drag that back down again um maybe not quite that far and bring it up a little. Yeah. I mean, this is not a finished photo. This is just a live stack. I've only got 13 minutes on this object. Usually I would get more like four hours, uh, six, if I have the opportunity. Um, that would let me get a much cleaner image with much less uh, noise in the background. However, I will save this and maybe uh, process it later on and share it. But I will now, I think, move on to the moon which I know is very popular. So let's go find that. Actually, before I do, I'm going to go and change back to the outside camera. And we'll go to the live video preset again. Uh, and I just need to make it fit auto. There we go. So the Jew is returning, but it's not too bad yet. So the moon is sort of over this way. Let's watch the telescope slew when we go to the moon. There it is. Oh, it's quite high at the moment. So we are over here. And we'll tell it it's to slew to the current object. And let's go watch. Oh, it's going all the way around. Okay, so... Um, the moon is on the other side of what we call the meridian. It's a line that goes from north to south through the zenith, the zenith being the point straight overhead. The telescope, it can get around to the meridian and then it sort of runs up against a, a hard stop. So it, instead of going past it, it has to go all the way around again. Uh, that also helps prevent cables from getting tangled up too much and the, um, the counterweights from hitting the legs of the tripod. But this is always a bit of a, a nail-biting moment because it is the point at which loose cables can get caught up on things and pull out. And unfortunately, I need to do a better job with my cable management. Uh, and so there is a risk of cables getting caught up on stuff. Uh, it looks like we've moved around on target. Let's check Stellarium. And yes, it thinks we're putting at the moon. Let's go back to our observing camera. And there we go. So the settings that I had for the previous uh, previous camera are not going to work for this because it's way too bright on the moon. So let me just tweak these a little bit. <coughs> All right, let me tweak these a lot. <laughs> okay, we can drag the gain right down. And uh, we can drop that too a bit. Now, it's not quite centered. So we'll fix that, but I'm just going to do a quick um, auto white balance first because I don't like that that red color. All right, so we'll turn on our crosshairs and we'll center the moon. So which way do we need to go? Yep, I got it right first time. That doesn't happen often. Okay, about there is good. 
So we'll turn off the crosshairs. And just before I change the settings for the moon, I will go back into Stellarium and synchronize it. So it knows it's pointing at the right spot. That makes it easier the next time we go uh, to a different target. All right, so I think I will up the gain a little bit so that I can drop the exposure time, which means it'll be a little faster. There we go. All right, so let's zoom in on that. Let's get 100%. So what you're seeing, uh, that's right, I'm using the binning as well. Uh, don't worry about that technical uh, technical ob uh, item. So we will change that and we'll get much higher resolution now. There we go. How good does that look? Now that shimmering that you can see there, that, that sort of wobbling effect going on, uh, that's not because of your streaming, not because of the compression. It's because of the uh, atmosphere moving and causing the uh, the moon to shimmer. It's sort of like being at the bottom of a swimming pool and trying to look up at the sky through the swimming pool. The, the water moving around causes the light to um, refract and um, get uh, sort of moved around a lot, which is what's happening here with the moon. And uh, one other thing I'm noticing is that because I am tracking the star's movement, the moon moves slightly different speed. So I'll check it onto lunar tracking and that will hopefully keep the moon in the same spot all the time. <coughs> so let's uh, find an interesting spot on the moon and uh, zoom in a bit closer. Oh yeah, up there looks nice. Things are always more interesting around the edge of the shadow because that brings out the details, the relief uh, in higher contrast. So. Let's bring up the gain a little bit. You know, that's coming through at one frame a second. I don't need to be at one millisecond. I can increase the exposure time without affecting the frame rate. That way I can drop the gain right down. Because gain is like a, a volume knob or an ISO dial. Uh, as you add gain, you add noise. So let's zoom into, uh, let's say, 200%. I'll go 300 It'll look a little bit pixely, but you'll really be able to see some details there. Look at that. Look at the different terraces on the crater walls there. You can see them stepping up. And we've got two little peaks, middle mountains in the middle of that. And you can also see these very faint lines radiating away from the crater. Uh, that's as a result of the material that was thrown up by the impact when the uh, object that created the crater hits the moon. Um, so I'm gonna leave that on screen for a moment. And in fact, what I might do is I'm going to turn off tracking for a second so you can watch it move across the screen and you'll get a slow pan. Oh, not too slow. That's quite fast. <laughs> All right, we'll turn back on the uh, lunar tracking and zoom back out to 100%. And we'll move it down the bottom here. And I might change the exposure to auto because it will keep up. Okay, no, that's not working. It's overexposing. That's all right, we'll drop it back down manually. And I'll zoom into 200% and then I'll let it go across the screen while I look at some of your questions. So we'll go stop. All right, let's catch up. Okay, Nick asks, what scope am I using? I'm using a, uh, an eight inch, uh, 20 centimeter diameter F4 Newtonian reflecting telescope. So it's a mirror telescope uh, and it's on a, an equatorial mount that will track the stars and I'm using uh, an astrophotography camera to get these images. Helen, there goes your early night. Well, I'm glad you think it's worth it. <laughs> Arena, say hello to your 11-year-old for me. I'm glad you're enjoying yourselves.
Okay, a question about the galaxy from earlier. How far away is it? Uh, since we've moved off that target in Stellarium, I will look it up. And just before I do that, I'm going to zoom back out and we'll go to a slightly different part of the moon and you can watch us pan over that. All right, let's see if that looks good. There we go, slightly different view. Um, so what was the galaxy again? It was 253. So I'm looking it up in an app that I use on my phone called Sky Safari. It's uh, fantastic. It's, um, it's a paid one and you pay more for getting more objects and stars in the catalogs. But uh, for someone keen on astronomy and astrophotography, it's well worth it. So NGC 253, also known as the Sculptor Galaxy or the Silver Coin Galaxy, is located 12 million light years away. So it's a relatively close galaxy. 12 million light years is the distance light travels in 12 million years, and it travels about 10 billion billion kilometers per year. So 12 million light years is a long, long way, but it's still close as galaxies go. Okay, let's uh, reset this. I'm still catching up on your comments. So I'll go back west again to catch up with the, the leading edge of the moon. And we'll go a little bit further north for this pass. There we go. <coughs> Thank you so much to the, uh, the MBO elves for helping out answering questions. There's a lot that I'm not able to get to because I'm concentrating on other stuff, but uh, I really appreciate your help there. The folks at MBO really know their stuff. Okay, Stuart has provided an answer to the white holes question. Um, and when Stuart provides an answer, you listen because he is extraordinarily knowledgeable about uh, all things astronomy, but especially astrophysics and cosmology. So the, the kind of topics like white holes. So he says that white holes are the opposite of black holes. Nothing can enter a white hole. So it's a uh, legitimate solution to Einstein's gravitational uh, um, equations but there's no known way that they could form and aren't thought to appear in reality. So they are theoretical, but not fantastical. So thank you very much, Stuart, for correcting me on that. Uh, Nick, yes, I was noticing the same thing with uh, Cloudy Nights. It hasn't updated in the last couple of days. So I was hesitant to schedule this um, this session ahead of time because I didn't know uh, if we'd actually have good weather, but fortunately it worked out. All right, now that we have had a look at the moon for a little bit, I will turn back on sidereal tracking and we'll move it back to the center a bit more for the moment. But I will move on to the next object. And since we're configured now with our settings for high frequency exposures, I might go and look at some of the planets. All right, so. Let's go to Jupiter. <clears throat> 
Now you can see Jupiter, Saturn and the Moon are all sort of in a line there at the moment. Let's do Saturn first then since that's kind of on the way. All right, um, let's, let's up the gain again. There we go, that's Saturn. You can tell because it's, it's very oval in shape. You also notice how small it was. Like the moon was this size before, but Saturn is so tiny. Uh, its apparent size in the sky is very, very small, which means that my telescope gear is not really ideal for it, um, but it's enough that we can have a, a look at it and uh, and still enjoy a little view. Let me just center it properly first. Wrong way. Close enough, and we'll synchronize Stellarium again. And let's go back. Turn off the crosshairs and we'll zoom in to say 300%. Now remember, my gear is not ideally suited for planetary photography, but we can still see it. Now that's overexposed, so we'll drop down the, uh, the gain a bit. That will hopefully get rid of some of that noise as well. And there we go. We've got some rings. It's Probably a bit hard to see and hard to tell, but um, Saturn does have cloud bands like Jupiter. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, let me just turn on the cool. That might help a little bit with the noise. Um, but it won't really show up uh, in, in the gear that I'm using. So we'd need to um, take a whole bunch of short images of Saturn and then stack them together, similar to what I do for the stars. But uh, with Saturn, it will bring out the, the color of the cloud bands and uh, in, in, increase the contrast and may even show some details in the rings. But again, my uh, equipment is optimized for wide field stuff that's very faint, whereas planets are very, very small and much brighter than nebulae. So it's uh, trying to do a job with gear that it's not really uh, well suited to. And I think I'm getting so far behind on answering your comments that I think I'm going to have to skip forward because I want to see your reaction to Saturn. Uh, I think I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one, Justine. It's a very personal thing, of course, but I love Jupiter. Uh, I think Jupiter is uh, cool for many reasons, and I'll talk about that when we go over to Jupiter shortly. But I'll let you love Saturn because it is beautiful. Uh, it looks like people are enjoying Saturn, which is nice. Uh, ben asks, do I need to refocus from stars to planets? No. Um, the planets are so far away that the optics of the telescope, uh, it's essentially at infinity for all objects. So uh, it's not really an issue. Uh, if, if something was like five kilometers away, then I'd probably have to refocus. But the planets and the stars are all at infinity as far as the uh, optics are concerned. Oh, well, you've redeemed yourself then, Justine. <laughs> I just caught up to where people were making comments and I didn't realize at the timing of when you made that. But yes, Jupiter is amazing and we'll go to that in just a second. So uh, before we move on, I want to just see if we can pick up Titan, uh, Saturn's largest moon. It won't be visible in... Uh, with these settings because the uh, Titan is, is quite a bit fainter than Saturn. So I've got the exposure here tuned to see Saturn. Let's up the exposure and see if we can pick out Titan. There it is. See that little dot down there? That is Saturn's moon Titan. It is the largest moon 
in the solar system. It is quite significantly larger than our moon and it has an atmosphere. Uh, it's not a breathable atmosphere by any stretch. Uh, it's mostly methane. It also has lakes and rivers, but they're not lakes and rivers of water. They're lakes and rivers of essentially petrol, hydrocarbons. Um, it's a very familiar and very alien place. Uh, one day I'd love to see a space probe uh, exploring the surface of Titan. We had one that let, let uh, crash landed on Titan called Huygens that went along with the Cassini space probe, which hopefully you've heard of before. And it showed us some interesting images of its descent, which is when we first discovered the lakes. Uh, I believe that was when we first discovered them. And um, it was, you know, very, very cool to see. But I want to see something like um, Opportunity uh, on on uh, on Titan. It'd be so cool to be able to drive around and, you know, go up to the edge of these petrochemical or the uh, uh, hydrocarbon lakes and see what they look like. <coughs> Uh, Nick suggests that I need magnification for planets and a reducer for large nebulae. Uh, yes, um, that's probably uh, a combination better suited to a, uh, a Schmidt uh, Cassegrain telescope. Um, they've generally got longer fields of view, uh, sorry, longer focal lengths and smaller fields of view. Uh, but my Newtonian reflector is uh, ideal for nebulae and I'd need to do a fair bit of uh, jury rigging to get a better image uh, of planetary stuff. And so it, it probably would be better off um, just buying a different telescope for that, which I hope to do one day. Uh, Bish is asking about the Streamyard logo. Uh, yes, that's because I'm trialing this on the uh, the free version. So this is just my own uh, login that I'm using for this for the time being. Uh, hopefully we can get uh, that sorted out for MBO soon, or at least uh, uh, we'll try it out for a month. Ah, Trevor has corrected me. So the largest in the solar system is Ganymede, which is just a little bit larger than Titan. So thank you for that correction, Trevor. Ganymede is one of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, the main ones, the big ones that were found by Galileo when he first turned his telescope on it. And Ganymede is an amazing moon as well. <coughs> All right, let's go have a look at Jupiter. Now, Jupiter I know is a lot brighter than Saturn, so I'm going to dial this down a little bit before we go there. So good old Jupes by Jove. Jove being another name for Jupiter, of course. <laughs> All right, let's see if we've picked it up. There it is, by Jove indeed. Keep consistently being off by uh, about half a degree in the uh, western direction or eastern direction, actually. Yes. Oh, a bit too far. Oh, way too far the other way. Okay, we'll add that to Stellarium, synchronize that. Did that synchronize? All right, and now we shall zoom in and have a look. And excuse me for a second, I'm just gonna mute so I can cough. Sorry folks, I get a frog in my throat quite frequently. There we go. All right, let's turn that down a little bit and see if we can pick up the uh, the bands. Oh, bit of lag. Ah, we've got too much gain on that. There's too much noise. There we go. That's what we're looking for. So you can clearly see we've got at least two bands of cloud across Jupiter there. Uh, at the, the north and south, we can see we've got a little bit of a cap going on. Uh, now, these aren't, they're polar caps, but they're not ice caps. They're just different colored gases uh, that, that accumulate at different latitudes. Um, so, again, this is not ideal uh, equipment, but uh, this is sort of close to what, what you could see through a telescope with your own eye. Um, a larger telescope would make it look this big. 
Um, but to our, uh, like to an eight inch uh, Newtonian reflector looking through, our, uh, through it with our own eyes, it might look about this big if you're sitting like a couple of feet back from your, your monitor, about a meter back from your monitor. Um, and in fact, that actually looks a little better because we're not seeing any of the, the pixels from magnifying it too much. Although I don't know how it looks on your, um, on your screens. I might actually zoom right in because I know that with uh, people looking at it on mobile ver uh, mobile devices, uh, it would be very, very small. So zooming right in might help. Let's see what uh, questions we've got. <coughs> would I recommend a Newtonian or Cassegrain telescope for astronomy of the moon and planets? Definitely a Schmidt Cassegrain, I think is your better choice there. Um, that they will give you a much longer focal length, which is really what is ideal for planetary work. Uh, again, though, because they're so different, uh, if you have a, a equipment that specializes in planetary work, then you're not going to have as much success with uh, nebulosity and wide field stuff. Um, one advantage to planetary photography is that you can do it pretty much anywhere. Light pollution doesn't factor so much. Um, heat haze coming off a city does affect things. But if the um, planets are high in the sky where you're shooting, then um, that's not so much of a problem anymore. So a lot of um, urban astrophotographers specialize in planetary work. And in fact, there's uh, um, one photography in, in Tokyo who produces amazing uh, images from the balcony of his high rise apartment in Tokyo. So you wouldn't be able to do any other astrophotography in Tokyo than that. <coughs> Um, Stephen asks if I can stack some images of Jupiter. Uh, I will capture some data, but um, I don't really want to take the time to um, stack it live on, on, on the screen because it can take a while and I'd rather stay nimble and keep looking around to a few other targets. So we will come back to that another time. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll capture now and I'll process it later and, uh, and share that process. So uh, actually, I should stop that. I don't need to capture the entire frame. I just need to capture a region of interest. So can I do that with dragging? How do I do region of interest? I don't do planetary imaging nearly often enough to remember how to do these things. Um, camera controls, image controls. Maybe it's in the tools. Where on earth is region of interest? Let me go back up to 100%. That might help. Yeah, I don't want to capture all of this. Ah, that's what I do. I change the capture area. We'll go down to 644.80 and see how that looks. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's even too much. Uh, we'll try 320 by 240. This will let me capture at a faster frame rate too. Um, so we'll zoom back in so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, lag. There we go. All right. So we will start capture of 3000 frames and uh, that will let me pick out the best ones and then stack those for higher detail. You get much better results uh, with stacking and processing, but uh, it is a bit of time. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Adam. That's very generous of you to remind folks. You don't have to become a member. You can always uh, just donate or you can um, purchase some of our merch, uh, mbo.org.au slash shop. Uh, now, those 3,000 frames only took 31 seconds and I know you can do Jupiter for about five minutes before um, it becomes a problem. So I might capture, we'll say five minutes of frames. The reason why uh, there's a question of how long you can capture is that Jupiter, it rotates extremely quickly. Its day is only 10 hours long as opposed to hour 24. So your, um, your camera will pick up that change in uh, more than five minutes. So that will cause it to sort of have a, a motion blur effect as it rotates. So uh, I'm going to stick with a five-minute sequence, and that will give me... Uh, 
probably maybe 20, 30,000 frames to stack, which is great. That means I can pick the absolute best of those. Uh, it's called lucky imaging. It, there is uh, moments when the atmosphere is still or the distortion that occurs is larger than Jupiter. And so Jupiter is not affected by it. Um, and that means that you can process it, the so they use processing software to pick out those frames uh, to stack and you, get, can, you, uh, you can get a better result from that. <clears throat> okay, a couple of questions. Um, how do I focus my telescope? I used to do it by hand, and that was very frustrating. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine, Alex, uh, helped me with a custom-built Arduino-controlled micro, uh, not micro, sorry, um, stepper motor uh, to drive the uh, telescope autofocus. Uh, and using the right software, I can connect that into my imaging software and I use um, the focusing routine in Sequence Generator Pro to use autofocus on stars. And that lets me do it without touching the telescope so it doesn't shake around, which always made it hard to focus. It also gets it far more accurately. And it also means it can be done automatically. As the telescope cools through the night, because it's kept inside, so it's kept at sort of room temperature. Um, but as the night gets colder and colder, the telescope gets colder and it contracts. And that change in the telescope shape is enough to change its focus. And so I have my imaging sessions uh, set up to automatically take uh, or do an hour's worth of photography and then focus again, just to make sure that the focusing isn't drifting throughout the night. So it's uh, fast and accurate and uh, I haven't looked back since I did it. Uh, Nick asks again, uh, uh, first of all, uh, what size is the scope and is it on a mount? Uh, I've Described this before, but very quickly I'll go over it again. I have an eight inch F4 reflecting Newtonian telescope mounted on an HEQ, uh, uh, HEQ6 um, telescope equatorial mount. So uh, that's um, a pretty good setup and lets me do a lot of stuff. Um, yes, um, MBO, I think this might've been Jackie, mentions that uh, the Jupiter focus on the moon's in the side of it. Uh, so that means you uh, it's not affected as much by the, the atmospheric distortion, so it's easier to focus. Um, but mentioning the moons reminds me that I will definitely zoom out and show you Jupiter's moons, uh, the main four, the Galilean moons, before I move on to the next target. Wonderful, Arona. Thank you for joining and welcome. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy your stay with us. Uh, Nick, yes, that's absolutely what I use. Uh, I use AutoStacker because that's got slightly better um, stacking algorithms I find than uh, Registax and I use Registax to sharpen the results. So yes, they're, they're good, good free pieces of software. Christy asks, do we see the bands of on Jupiter at different angles depending on its rotation or orbit when viewing? No, the bands are generally pretty consistent. Um, they change in appearance over years. Sometimes one of them can get brighter or fainter. Sometimes some narrower bands can appear beside them. Um, and, of course, the, the great red spot is still there, and that will appear occasionally. But it doesn't really change uh, much depending on our position uh, relative to Jupiter in our orbit or its orbit. Uh, Saturn's rings do appear to change because they're um, very much tilted on an angle and can, uh, as our inclination relative to Saturn changes, the, the rings seem to open up and close down. But um, Jupiter just being a ball, it doesn't really change that much. All right. We've caught our sequence of Jupiter, so let's move on. Now, I'm gonna go off to my desktop and I'm gonna look at what objects are currently visible that I want to image. And we can go and have a look at one of those next. So what have we got? 
We've done a galaxy, so I might skip those for now. There's a lot of galaxies up at the moment. This is galaxy season. Uh, because the Milky Way has most of the, the nebulae and clusters, it's um, when the Milky Way is below the horizon, you're looking out of the Milky Way, and that's where the galaxies appear. Uh, and that's sort of the time of the year we are at the moment. Ah, uh, yes, let's go and look at one of my favorite objects, NGC 2070. Who can tell me what that is in chat? I know some of you will know it. NGC 2070. Okay, object and slew. Uh, let me just go back and catch up on some more questions. Thanks for coming by, Paul. I appreciate you hanging around. You've probably gone by now, but uh, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> I appreciate you helping out with answering questions too. Uh, Heidi asks, what are you exactly doing by stacking? Um, it's a little different for planetary work than it is for um, nebula work. Uh, with a nebulae, because they're faint, you are really working at the, the sort of the noise floor where the noise in the sensor is as bright as the object that you are imaging. So stacking, what that does is it averages out the noise between the frames and it lets you add together the signal. That's the, the light that you're shooting. So it improves the signal to noise ratio, which means you can get much fainter objects and reveal details that you couldn't otherwise. In planetary work, because they're bright enough, um, what stacking does is it uh, lets you pick the best moments in the atmospheric turbulence when it's most stable. And of those best moments that you capture, you can actually break up the image into sections and pick the best portions of those frames uh, to then construct an image of the planet from. And the software does that all automatically. There is some degree of noise reduction, but noise is not nearly as big a factor in planetary work as it is in nebulosity work or other deep sky objects. So let's see if we've got our new target in here. We'll have to zoom back out, go to full frame size, so not a region of interest any longer, and we'll go to our finding preset. There we go, that's it. So we will change it over to our imaging preset. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it is until we get an image of it. Are we tracking? Yes, we are. I thought I saw it moving. So you'll see in a second what we're looking at. Oh, Anna, yes, I did forget the moons. I'm sorry. I will go back to that after this object. Uh, Janelle asks, how many computer screens am I looking at? On my desk, two, and technically a third one because what you're seeing here is a mirror on my desktop of the laptop screen outside. So technically I'm looking at three, but one of them is inside another. <laughs> Let me just turn my heater back on. It's getting a bit cool. Sorry if the heated noise in the background is audible. Uh, the software I'm using does try to filter that out, so hopefully you won't pick it up. Okay, we're getting lots of requests for items, uh, objects to look at. I think um, a few of them might be uh, hard to see because they might be below the horizon. And I just realized we're not live stacking in this one. We're just doing continuous subs. I'll reset that and start again. Um, so yeah, a lot of the things like Cat's Poor Nebula might be a bit too low in the West. Uh, I shall have a look after we've gone back to Jupiter's moons. But first of all, the Tarantula Nebula. This is a favorite. So yes, those of you who guessed, guessed Tarantula are correct. <laughs> Nick, 
don't you know that's my goal <laughs> i stay on an object long enough for it to be interesting and when people think oh maybe i'll turn in now that's when i go over to another interesting object just to hook you and keep you in <laughs> All right, we've got 60 seconds on this object now. So let's do a quick stretch. First of all, I'll zoom in a bit because it's the extremes, the extremities of this aren't too visible just yet. Ah, and I forgot to turn on my guiding. So let me do that first. So we will uh, pick a star, start our guiding. And I will reset that stack just because the stars are looking a little bit a bit oblong, which I don't like. Just check how the guiding's looking. It's only just getting started. We'll see. Well, hopefully it'll stay in here. All right, let's go back to our imaging and see what we've got. Uh, it's still a little bit elongated. Maybe um, I, I haven't col collimated my telescope in the last couple of times I moved it in and out because I was doing testing. Uh, collimating is aligning the optics to make sure they're all perfectly in position. Um, maybe I had bumped it and so it's just a little bit off, which is why the stars aren't perfectly round. Okay, um, for those of you who use Cloud Free Night, Adam's just posted a detailed update on what's happening there. I won't read it out, but I'll leave it on screen for you to have a look at uh, if you are interested in, in it. Uh, it's essentially talking about uh, some goings on at the Cloud Forecast website that I use. It's very handy, but it hasn't been operating for the last few days. Uh, Amy is asking for Arky. <laughs> he walked past just a, a few minutes ago. He's he's beside me here. Um, I, he's snoozing though, so I don't really want to pick him up and bring him to the camera. But if he wakes up, I'll, I'll definitely make sure that you can see him. All right. Now that we've got uh, seven minutes, sorry, seven, eight frames, let's tweak our, our histogram a little bit. And it's definitely looking a bit red. That's better, but I might bring the saturation up a bit. How much can we bring out? Starting to get somewhere. Again, this is an object that does uh, do well with a lot more exposure time, but it, it's still a very cool object. I might let that run for just a little bit longer. Yeah, that color's looking pretty good now. I just had a message from Peter saying that he is setting up for the uh, occultation. I'm not exactly sure when it will happen but I am going to invite him into the uh, the chat or into the stream and he can join whenever he's ready if he wants to. So hopefully we'll see him sometime soon. 
Um, so this is still going to be collecting data. I'm going to let it go a little bit longer. There's quite a bit of noise in the background there still because I've stretched the exposure a lot. That means I've I've brightened things up, which has also brightened up the noise. Uh, but you can see it's slowly starting to reveal some detail there. There's lots of sort of lobes and loops of nebulosity, which is uh, really quite beautiful. I'm glad to see everyone is still enjoying it and uh, liking the images as they come in. Uh, here we go. Here's Peter. Well, I can see him. Uh, Peter, do you want to join in the live stream? Just uh, wave or nod if you can hear me and you want to. Yep. All right. Fantastic. How you doing, mate? Good to see you. Everyone, this is Peter Schottel. He's from Mount Bernard Observatory. He's a fellow astrophotographer. Uh, can't hear you at the moment, though, Peter, so I'm not sure if you've got your microphone settings sorted out. Okay, yeah, it looks like Peter will need a moment to, to sort out his audio settings, but hopefully we'll be seeing him soon or hearing from him soon. Uh, and... Hopefully not too long after that, he'll be able to share his screen so I can put that on and we might be able to watch some science in action as he uh, observes an occultation that is a, an asteroid passing in front of a star. And he can explain to you uh, why that is cool and what it means. Once he joins us. <laughs> <laughs> Ella is correct. <laughs> you can tell I'm an astrophotographer apart from everyone else by the red light. That's all uh, astronomers as well, actually, imaging astronomers and visual astronomers. Although, to be honest, um, visual astronomers care more than we imagers do because we're often looking into our laptop screens and that ruins our night vision. So uh, we use red whenever we can, but uh, it's not as often as the visual folks. So it looks like Peter's... Uh, Still trying to nut this out. So we'll give him a little bit of time. I might uh, finish up on this one then. So we've got uh, 6.45. We'll wait till it gets to seven minutes and then I'll save it. And then I might just hop back over to Jupiter and show you the moons, which we missed last time. Can you hear, okay. hear me, Neil? Yes, that's it. Fantastic. Okay. Welcome, Peter. Great to hear you. <laughs> um, my video capture device that I'm using for the occultation grabs hold of the microphone, and of course, it doesn't have a microphone. Oh, wow. How frustrating. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't you, work it out for a minute. Why would a video device... Oh, I suppose you're using your webcam. Is that right? Yeah. I, um, my... Um, the camera that I use for occultations is is a uh, works like a video camera, and it uses a capture device, video capture device, to convert from analog to uh, digital. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. Um, right. So there's no way you can tell it to to not use the audio. Yeah, that's what I've done to to speak. Oh, now. okay. So you're able to uh, still use that camera while not using its audio? Correct. Oh, that's a relief because I was afraid you might have to turn off audio when you come to do your observations. No, no, we're right now. I've, um, Liam actually went inside, run inside to get a different microphone, but that wasn't the problem. Uh, okay. All right. Um, do you want me to share my screen? Now, how do you do Just that? Just before you... Yeah. Uh, I'm back on Jupiter, so I okay. just want to very quickly show folks uh, what Jupiter looks like with its moons. Okay, so let me zoom back out, and we'll go into uh, faster exposure times. And 
auto white balance. Um, you can share your screen though, Peter, and I will get it ready for when you uh, come on. Like I'll be able to see it so I can just click on it to add it. Okay, let's zoom. Actually, I'll do a region of interest first so it makes it a bit faster. There we go. So we've got uh, three of Jupiter's moons visible there. Um, the other one is probably either behind or in front, and it's being lost in the glare from Jupiter. Um, but these were first discovered by Galileo uh, back in the, the very early 1600s. And um, it was the first time, because he saw them moving from night to night, he deduced mm -hmm. that they were orbiting Jupiter, they were going around Jupiter. And it was the very first time there was direct observational evidence that there was a, not everything in the universe revolved around the earth. Uh, and that eventually caused a, a great deal of consternation uh, in the Catholic church and pit Galileo against the, the, the Pope. Um, and of course, as we, we know now that uh, Galileo was correct and the Catholic church finally issued a formal apology to Galileo for his mistreatment as a result of, uh, of of them not agreeing with him in 1974, about 400 years later. All right, so I uh, will now put Peter's uh, screen on the stream so you can see what he is looking at and I can watch too. <laughs> so Peter, right. would you care to describe what we're seeing here? Okay, on this side here, can you see the mouse okay? Yes. This side here, that's um, my star chart and um, the little star marked here with the with the uh, cross is the target star that's going to be occultated by the asteroid that's going to um, like a lunar, like an eclipse. Yep. Now, over on the other side here, the this is my camera display and these two what look like stars one's the asteroid and the other one is the star so aboard, yeah so that that gap will slowly get closer and closer it's gonna the occultation will happen at about uh from memory about five six minutes past 11 so i'm not going to share my screen for that long and sit yep, here and watch come that. back to it yeah so but tell us if, before we do ahead. I think I'm going to preempt oh, uh, this one. This is a reminder that it's due in 44 minutes. Um, okay, this is a little um, piece of information about it. It's uh, Palatea, um, number 415. Yep, so that's the asteroid number. Now, we're looking, if you look at... Can I make this bigger? No. Uh, all right. So I can't make this bigger very easily. Now I've lost it totally. Here we go. All right. So if we look up... It needs to be spun around. So Mars is over here. So what you're looking at there is without a is horizon, night, is that right? Current night sky, yes. Uranus, Mars, and then as we come up towards the moon, um, the asteroid is in this point here. Ceres is um, another asteroid or dwarf planet. And Pluto and Jupiter and Saturn are just over here. So it's very near to the moon at the moment, isn't it? So, yeah, we're very close to the moon. And Ceres is there too. Neptune's just over here. So it's a very busy sky. And Eris is a um, TNO, trans-Neptune asteroid. So it's on the outer belt, not on the inner belt, whereas... Um, the asteroid we're looking at is on the inner belt, I'm pretty sure. 
I'm just going to share another, we'll bring up another application. Folks, if you have any questions for Peter uh, about occultations or his equipment or anything else, feel free to leave them in the chat and we'll get to them uh, when we can. Um, I believe Jackie's on the chat. Jackie, um, and she's chatting as... Um, as MBO? As MBO. She's, uh, she actually wrote the... <laughs> the manual for asteroid occultations for the Southern Hemisphere. So she'll be able to answer those questions too. Jackie right, is an is expert some, on occultations. Absolute expert, yes. Um, Occult Watcher is where we get our feeds and, and um, information about the asteroids. This is tonight's, and I'm just going to, I'll double click to show you a bit of information. So, this green line is the center path of what effectively would be the shadow, the center of the shadow. The blue lines are the outside, the edges of the shadow. And the red lines are um, sigma errors and, and, and things like that. Um, there's another observer. His name's Dean, who's um, setting up. He, this is his path. There's only two of us on, on this event tonight. Oh, so, wow. Um, that's um, about 50%. I'll, I'll zoom right out. I'm not too sure why some of the others aren't on it, actually. Oh, no, they, they, they missed. So there's um, um, people that I know of in... Uh, Adelaide, which we don't see them too often, certainly in the Sydney, um, Brisbane, Queensland and um, central Queensland and New Zealand that are on um, events quite frequently and we've got our own chat forums and we discuss events. All right, um, I was going to give you a little bit more information about this asteroid. Um, yeah, that'd be great, thank you. All right, so it's a main belt asteroid. It's 83 kilometers, well, it has a diameter of 83 kilometers, a 20 hour rotation period. And that's um, about all I'm going to. So we've viewed this previously. We know quite a bit of information about it. These are events that have uh, of previous observations. Um, what I record, and later on I'll show you the re, um, timestamps and things like that. Yep. Um, we record the video that has a um, timestamp that comes from the satellites. From GPS? The, yeah, on, of, yeah, GPS. And... Um, the analysis video can read the timestamps and we target the star and it records the um, pixels of light that disappear. And when they disappear, it records that time. And when it re returns and uh, records that time and there's errors and things like that involved with it. Um, and that's how we get um, and work out the shape of asteroids and uh, and things like that. Um, so by observing an occultation, you're able to determine the size and shape of an asteroid? Yes, and confirm its path. Um, what else do we do? Um, probably the confirmation of its path is one of the most important things. Right. Um, they quite frequently um, get bumped and taken off path. And I've even been on some... Um, events and a couple of days before some observations of seen a, a, an asteroid move and and then we've had to update all our gear and timings and things like that so I remember watching one with you once when um, it was expected it was going to be a very like a, a central path you're going to be in the right in the middle of it and then it dis it didn't disappear the the asteroid didn't wasn't where you so, thought it was going to be that's right. So we call, we call that we had a miss. We, did, we didn't see, have an observation. So today we're pretty much right in the middle of the path. Um, 
the probability of an, an occultation is um, 91% with a rank of 100. So we know, which means we know a lot about this asteroid. So it's a very high confidence level that you will see an occultation based on our understanding of the object. Correct. I'm just going to go back. And so in those occasions where things don't happen as you expect, is that something that can then update our, our knowledge of the universe, the actual science? Yeah, absolutely. All, um, all the recordings get updated. Quite often we have um, limitations with our equipment. Sometimes I uh, I, I only use a 8-inch Schmidt Cashigan. Um, whereas there are other observers that um, use up to 40 centimetre um, telescopes and the, with the, um, almost professional observatory setups. Um, uh, I've upgraded my camera earlier this year to be the same as what um, all those guys use. So um, it's... Uh, very sensitive in that regard. I'm going to. I can open this. It's always up. fun so, getting a new camera, isn't it? Sorry, sorry. Say that again. It's always fun getting a new camera, isn't it? Yes, yes. But then it goes cloudy, doesn't it? Yes, right. that's right. <laughs> um, these are the settings for my camera just here, and um, you, you're processing video and. Um, stacking the video this camera does a similar effect um on the run on the fly and it does it within the camera itself so i'm laying four fr effectively laying four frames to get this view here if i right. increase it we yeah, should be able to increase well, i've lost my camera control should be able to increase the the number of stars that we see. Ah, now, I'm just going to... So the number of stars that we can see now. To give you an idea, this, this one here is a ninth magnitude star. Um, I've lost my target now. It's drifted off the the, the, the top it end has. of the um, screen. Yep. That's why you recenter that. I just want to um, remind everyone uh, and thank the uh, MBO volunteers who are helping out in the chat. Um, we've got uh, Heike, Stuart, Jackie, uh, who are answering many questions. And uh, we've got a few other uh, members and non-members in the chat who are also helping out answer questions where they can. And that's fantastic. I really appreciate that. Uh, there's a lot that uh, Peter and I are, are trying to do here at the same time. So it's hard to focus on answering questions and, and giving you a show at the same time. So uh, it's really appreciated having that assistance. So thank you very much, folks. Liam, can you hang it up, please? I've, if you haven't heard, realized, Liam's here with me. Yep. <laughs> Liam is one of our young members. He's uh, Peter's son and he's... Uh, even on our outreach team, he's been to a number of our uh, night at the observatory events up at the observatory, and he's been very enthusiastic showing people the night sky through his telescope. All right, that's all I've got for you um, before the event occurs. I've got a few things that I need to do, some checks to yep. run um, before the event. So um, do you want to... I can take, take over, over the screen again, and then uh, I'll let you know probably a few couple of minutes before the event, and we'll share then. That would be fantastic. Thank you. All right. So I shall send it back over to my screen, and I have been doing something in the background while you've been doing that. Uh, I've been imaging a faint but uh, very interesting object called a planetary nebula, and... Uh, it's very challenging at the moment because it's only a few degrees away from the moon and the moon is absolutely flooding the, uh, the field of view with light, which means that I'm having to really push the, uh, the stretch, the histogram here in order to see anything. So let me just zoom in a little bit more. I've got a 50%. Actually, that might even be too much. We'll go back out to 
33. And you can see we've got sort of a, a red oval here, sort of a, a red circle and a red oval around that. This uh, is the Helix Nebula, and it's a type of object called a uh, planetary nebula. And um, planetary nebulae are the corpses of dead stars. So when a star that is not big enough to end up going supernova, um, when it ends its life, there's a constant battle between gravity trying to pull everything in and expansion from heat trying to push everything out. And when stars get towards uh, their, their elderly ages, the, um, the heat ends up winning and it starts puffing away the atmosphere out into space. So um, that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing shells of stellar matter being ejected from uh, what once was a star. And you can see here this tiny white dot in the middle. That is the hot, dead core of the star that gave birth to this nebula and all of its atmosphere has been puffed off into space and all that's left is this furiously hot but incredibly small little star called a white dwarf and these stars are oh um, jackie might be able to confirm for me but something between the size of the earth and jupiter so they're they're not really uh anything like their parent stars when they were um fully in in full flight, you know, burning through their hydrogen and, and helium. Um, but they're, they're still very intensely hot and they'll take a very, very long time to cool down. Um, but unfortunately, with the moon so near, uh, it's really not giving us a, a good good image of that. Uh, but you can see it there. You can see that it's, a, it's quite a, a pretty little object, uh, but much prettier when it's not being overwhelmed. So I might go and see if we can find another. Uh, so Helen comments, it's a shame we don't look that beautiful when we die. Indeed it is, but our sun will look this beautiful when it dies because this is the kind of uh, result that will be from uh, the death of our sun. Our sun's not heavy enough in order to become a supernova. And so it will most likely end up as a planetary nebula like this. Uh, Kelly asks, is this the Helix Nebula? And yes, it is. You are correct. Well spotted. All right. So let's see what else is up at the moment. That might be oh, no. Hope you are... Hope All right. Peter, I'm just going to mute you for the time. All right, I'm looking through my list of objects that are currently up. I'm trying to find something that's a little different from what we've looked at before, but is not too close to the moon. So just give me a minute. Got a lot of globular clusters in my list mostly because they're the things that are visible at the moment. Oh, uh, no, that's below the horizon, that object. Let me just resort because a few things have set and a few things have risen. Got a, a, quite a few galaxies, but I'm not entirely sure how far they are from the moon oh that one's a good one is that uh, let me just check ah good this one's the opposite side from the moon we'll go have a look at that it's a galaxy 1365 so i'm not going to bother saving that one and we shall go to MGC 1365, locally known as the Great Bard Spiral in Fornax. So it's a very um, literal name. <laughs> uh, you'll see what, it, what I mean by Bard Spiral when we get an image of it. Uh, and Fornax is the, uh, the constellation that it appears in. And Fornax happens to have a lot of galaxies. There's a galaxy cluster in that direction. And this is one of the more interesting ones. Uh, 
All right, here we come. We've probably had to go all the way around the other side of the sky to get to this. But you can see the reticle homing in. Now, this is a faint object, so it may not appear in the uh, in the finding settings, but we'll just give it a, a, a look and see if we can see anything. Hmm. I'm just going to do a very quick live stack of these settings to see if it will pop up quickly. Ah, uh, yes, there it is. All right, so I will want to move down and to the left. So let's stop the live stack. So that's it there. All right, so just a moment. Other way. Yeah, I've lost sight of it amongst all the noise there. Oh, is that it? I think we're pretty close anyway. All right, let's go over to our imaging preset and see if we can pick something out. Turn off the uh, crosshairs and we'll go into a live stack because that always brings out details more uh, readily. It's wonderful. We've still got 116 people here. That's fantastic. It's great to have you along. Uh, things are a little bit slower and quieter now, partly because there's uh, fewer objects to look at uh, because the, um, the Milky Way, which has most of the cool stuff, is setting in the West. But um, I'm glad you're still enjoying yourselves enough to keep hanging around. All right, have you got enough here that we can start stretching? There is something there, but it's going to take a little bit more time to bring out Ah, there we go. We're really starting to get something now. That's only with 45 seconds of exposure. How about that? Oh, but look at all that noise. <laughs> okay. I forgot to reset my guiding. But uh, we'll just do it from here on. Not sure how much help guiding has been tonight anyway. But there's no harm in doing it, and it may help, so we'll give it a shot. All right, this is definitely going to need several minutes of data in order to reduce this noise background. So you can see what I'm talking about here before when I was saying that the the signal is at the same level as the noise. It's it's at the noise floor, so you can't go any lower than the noise. So when you bring the brightness of everything up, you bring up the noise as well. So we've got these faint arms coming out here and they're just barely brighter than the noise but by stacking images taking many images and averaging them out we should hopefully be able to reduce that noise and therefore be able to boost the signal and therefore get a cleaner image but this is where the patience comes in you need to do this for quite a while to get a great result and um if we don't get enough in the amount of time before I start getting bored, I'll show you a photo of this object I've taken previously. Uh, Justine, lovely to see you're still here. Uh, it's, uh, I know that astronomy isn't your, um, your first love, so uh, it means a lot that you're staying here to support me and to watch this, and I'm glad you're still enjoying it, so thank you. Uh, Kelly says that she's taking notes of what we can see each week. Wonderful. I'm glad you're uh, doing that. It's it's great to know what to look for. Uh, when you head outside with a pair of binoculars or your telescope, it can be like, wow, the sky is so big, where do I start? So having a list of targets is uh, a fantastic idea. Mm. 
No. <laughs> it's one I took myself. Trust me. <laughs> you enjoy making those cheeky comments, don't you? I remember you saying something similar to that before. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a great question, Adam. Is anyone watching from outside of Victoria? So interstate or overseas? Uh, if you're not in Victoria, please leave a comment uh, to say where you're from because we'd love to see uh, where our audience is watching from. I know looking at our stats that the vast majority of people who watch NBO live streams are from Melbourne. So uh, it would be terrific to see if there's anybody beyond that that uh, have joined us tonight. So say hello. All right, while I'm getting some data on this, I'll check in on Peter. How are you going there, Peter? What's up? All right. Is, Would you like me to share? Have you I unmuted again? Uh, thank you. You, you obviously did that. All right. The uh, I can see the asteroids getting closer together. Um, I've got everything ready and set up now. It's a matter of uh, waiting yep. for the event to occur. Do you need more than that? Because from where I see it, they're very close together, but it would be hard to tell when they're right on top of each other. No, that, but that's yeah, that's yeah. what's going to happen. Hopefully, <laughs> they're going to go right right on top. So the the predicted drop is um, 0.9 of a magnitude. So we should be able to see that. Um, I've actually turned it all down. So hopefully, so we can actually hopefully see it. So what do you say? Oh yes, <laughs> Liam's showing me that uh, we're yes. on the screen. Um, Yeah, I was just chatting to, to Dean, who's the other observer. He's set up and ready and on target. And, um, yeah, it, it's um, he thinks we should be able to see a bit of a, a drop. Well, that's exciting. I'm uh, glad to hear everything's still on target. All yep. right, I'll uh, go back to my screen for the, for a little bit longer. So let's see, and I'll mute you for also for now, Peter, just in case you want to chat with Liam. Um Thanks. That didn't click. Let's try that again. There we go. All right. Let's see if we can do anything more with this processing to bring out a little bit more contrast. Yeah, I'm bringing out contrast, but I'm also bringing out the noise. So we've got 24 frames uh, for six minutes. So I don't know if we're really going to get much better. You can see the, the contrast on these arms is coming out a little bit, um, but it really is quite a striking shape, isn't it? It's like a pair of sickles stuck together in the middle. So this is what it means by a barred spiral galaxy. You can see that the arms are curved. So that's what makes it a spiral galaxy. But you've got this rod connecting the, the corners of each of those arms. That's the bar. Um, that's just the way that galaxy has formed. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you the physical process behind how that happens. Uh, perhaps someone in the uh, the chat could do that. But um, it is a very striking and remarkable shape. Now, I'm just going to put... Um, I'm going to go full screen, actually, for my, my face for the moment um, because I'm going to go and load in another tab my uh, website with my images on and I'm doing that uh, invisibly just in case there's folks who uh, are not interested in seeing some of the other stuff I've got there. So I'm going to find the photo that I've taken of this object previously and show you how it can look uh, when it's had a lot of time spent on it. And while I do that, let's just quickly read out where we've got people coming from. So we've got Sydney, Kingston, Tasmania, King Island, Tassie, uh, we've got in, someone in Glen Rowan, uh, the Bigger Valley in New South Wales, Narandera in New South Wales, Ferntree Galley, that doesn't count, John. <laughs> um, uh, French Island, wow, that's cool. Uh, Alexandra in Northeast Victoria, Tropical Paradise of Ballarat. I'm sure Bar Ballarat is even colder than it is here at the moment. <laughs> um and Beaconsfield, Victoria. So definitely the vast, vast majority of people are in Victoria. 
um, which is wonderful. We love our Victorians. Uh, well, we love all folks, but uh, it, it's we're feeling a bit more solidarity with Victorians at the moment because of what we're going through. Um, but uh, we welcome people from all around. Okay, so this is an older image that I did a few years ago, and I'm not as happy with it as something I would have done today because there's a bit of noise in the background. But I think you'll agree when we compare with what we've got now. So there's our live image of this object called the Great Bard Spiral in Fornax. Um, but this is what it looks like when I imaged it a couple of years ago. So you can see there's a lot more to the photo there than I've been able to capture in the, the short few minutes that I've been imaging this so far. So you've got the, the spiral arms coming off here and you can actually see they extend a long way further around and we've got the bar connecting them to the core and we've got some, you know, more interesting stuff going on closer up and a few other little arms sort of splaying off from the center. So this is definitely an object that benefits from a lot more time. Uh, galaxies are very faint. So uh, Damon asks, is the Andromeda galaxy visible and worth looking at? Um, it's only visible for a few months of the year in from Melbourne, and even then it's only for a couple of hours a night to the far north. I don't think it's visible at all for me from my location because um, my uh, local horizon, the, uh, the house is to the north of where my telescope is. So it's not really visible for me, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Janelle. I'm glad you liked the photo. Uh, again, as a photographer, I'm my own worst critic and I can see all the flaws, but um, it, it did come out well and I look forward to returning to it someday to spend more time on it and to do better with the things that I've learnt. Uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud, yes, that's definitely visible. However, it is far too big to fit in my telescope field of view. Uh, my field of view is about one and a third by one degrees, whereas the Large Magellanic Cloud takes up about seven degrees of the sky. So I can't fit it all in my telescope. Uh, I can point at some of the smaller things within it, which I did earlier, um, the Tarantula Nebula being uh, that one that we went to. Um, and there's a few other smaller nebulae in that area that are nice. Uh, maybe we'll go to that later, but um, we'll have a look around and see what else there is here just before we do that. Oh, thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, lovely comments on that photo. Let's see if we can find uh, another object. And this time I'm going to try and pick something that's not quite so faint. Although that's a bit challenging right now because uh, the, the brightest objects are below the horizon right now. Oh, I think that maybe Mars might just be above my local horizon. Let's see if my suspicions are correct. Uh, yep, there it is. It's not far at all from where I am. And, oh, my horizon's been turned off. Where did, where did that happen? No, that's not it. There we go. I don't know why my artificial horizon or my local horizon was turned off. I must have clicked on that by accident. Um, but there's Mars. Let's go and see if we can find it. Turn off meteor showers because they're not really visible through the telescope. So Mars is selected, current object, and we shall slew to it. Uh, Linda, you missed the picture. Sorry about that. Um, this stream will be uh, available on the MBO website or the, the, um, the Facebook page uh, after the stream has finished. So you can go back and have a look at it. Um, how long have we been going for? Where's the, the time? Uh, we're going for two hours, 14. So perhaps if you want to fast forward to two hours and 10 minutes, it'll be somewhere around that point. All right, so let's see how close we got to Mars. So we'll clear that. 
zoom back out to full size and go to our finding preset. That's Mars. <laughs> it's very bright in that preset. So let's uh, go back to our imaging preset, but we'll need to speed things up a little bit. All right, so we'll go down to say one frame per second to start with. And yep, there it is. Now, Mars is um, much smaller in apparent size than uh, even Jupiter and Saturn. Well, not much smaller, but smaller. And so while my telescope wasn't ideal for Jupiter and Saturn, it's, it's less ideal, unfortunately, for Mars. But let's see what we can get nonetheless. Can zoom in a bit more on that. And let's center it a little bit better. Not quite there. All right, that's good. Now I shall do a quick auto white balance just because Mars is the red planet, but it's not quite that red. <laughs> and I will reduce the exposure time because that is way too bright. Uh, it's lagging again. Uh, can you hear my cat? <laughs> we might get a guest appearance shortly. Oh, yes, here he is. Hello. Okay, there we go. Let's zoom in on that. Let's go to 300. And I'm going to make it in the smallest region possible for the fastest frame rate. There we go. And that is actually the best I've ever seen Mars in this telescope. <laughs> we can see we've actually got some surface features here. Now, I have no idea what that is, but what we can do is we can go in and check out um, Instellarium shortly. Hang on, since he's here, he's not sleeping. This is Aki. <laughs> he's my ginger boy. He keeps me company. Uh, I'm in uh, lockdown by myself. So this little fella has been helping to keep me sane. Although he does drive me insane with how much he begs for food all the time. So uh, I appreciate his company most of the time. <laughs> uh, Helen just said, uh, I'll put it on screen. Uh, you are exactly right, Helen. He gets his supper at 11 p.m. Uh, he has uh, half a can of of wet food a day so a quarter of a can of wet food in the morning quarter of a can in the uh in the evening and then he gets uh about a tablespoon of dry food uh dry um cat food as a uh an evening snack so yeah that that's what he's he's starting to bug me for now <laughs> uh my lane uh thank you i agree he is gorgeous uh, he's a, a cute fairy boy. So let's see if we can center Mars a little bit better. Other way. Not quite that far. All right, I'll just update Stellarium. Synchronize. Now let's zoom in. Now one of the great things about Stellarium is that it has the planets modeled in it. And they're modeled to the current accurate time. So if I zoom right in on Mars, hopefully it should show me a map of how Mars looks currently. Oh, and I need to center on it, otherwise it'll keep following. All right, here we go. So this is what we're seeing in my field of view. So this dark patch here is actually a couple of dark patches and that is mirrored over here. Where's the camera? There it is. So it's rotated about 90, de uh, yeah, 90 degrees clockwise, but you can see you've got this horizontal band across here. Um, so I am going to try and do a quick capture of this while we go back to Peter, I think, because it's probably about time. How are we going, Peter? 
Good day, Neil. Have you taken me off mute? Yeah. Yes, I have. Yep, thank you. Um, all right, we've got seven minutes or just just under. The, if you've shared the screen, you can actually see the asteroids and the star has merged. It looks a little bit oval, although the others do too. There's a bit of atmos atmosphere um, causing that at the moment. But, um, yeah, this, they've merged, and in about seven minutes, we'll see a, should see a drop. So if you so, want to come back. Do we have any output um, that can help us see that drop? Like if you've got a, a, a number which is telling us how bright it is or can you plot a graph or something like that, or are we going to be dependent oh. on our own eyes to try and judge it? Yeah, it's, it's by eye to start off with. Um, once... I finish recording, I can then run the analysis software and, and get the graph. Fantastic. How long does it usually take you to get a graph out of that? About oh, five minutes. So that's something we can show folks tonight? Yep. Oh, terrific. That's really exciting. So you heard it first here, folks. We're going to get some <laughs> scientific results in our live stream from Peter's observations of this interesting uh, event of an occultation of a star by a minor planet. So that's, that's fantastic. So, all right, Peter, uh, I will leave you off mute now so that if I forget to come back to you, you can remind me. Uh, but we'll just return to Mars just for a little while Yep. Uh, while we wait for those last few moments of the, uh, the occultation uh, before sure. it begins. So I'm doing a, a, an image capture here, a sequence capture of Mars. Uh, I could go for a bit longer than five minutes because it doesn't rotate as quickly as Jupiter, but I'm going to go for five just because I don't want to have too much data to process uh, and also because I don't want you to folks to have to be waiting around for quite so long in order to see something. So uh, I can zoom in on that a little bit more. It's very pixelated, and as you can see, it's very wibbly-wobbly. Um, it's maybe half of the apparent diameter that Jupiter was in the field of view, so it's pretty small and again my equipment is not ideal for this we're only seeing it about what, 30 pixels across um in some really good planetary equipment they look much much better than that but um i've never imaged mars before so this is worth a go and you're seeing it all now for the first time all right let me just catch up on uh on comments Looks like everyone's loved Arky. Everyone always does. How can you not? He's sitting right here beside me. I'm glad you enjoy that. Oh, wrong one. Oh, thank you, Bo. Um, Madeline. <laughs> having a cat in isolation is, uh, well, having any companion pet is uh, really helpful. It's been a tough six months, so having someone or a, uh, a friend of some sort with me is uh, is very helpful. Um, Kelly asked, is there a name or number of the star that the asteroid will pass? And I believe it was probably Jackie answered. Uh, UCAC 4310-108786. Very romantic name. Uh, I think uh, yeah, we should write some poetry about that. Put it into song. <laughs> There's so many stars, we'd run out of words before we could give every one of them a name. So the UCAC4 is the catalogue. Uh -huh. And then the number is, is, is the, the star number of that catalogue. A star can have be numbered in a number of different catalogues with different numbers. Yep, that makes sense. There's a lot of numbers in all those catalogues, though, isn't there? <laughs> what can you tell us about that star, Peter? Is there any information? Like, is it a what 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 type is it? Is it a giant star or a, a, a G star like our uh, like our sun? Um, I I don't think I've just got to what. Uh, I wonder if I we could just do a Google search with that. Do you want to switch over to the screen? Yep. I've actually. It's time to start recording. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so we're now with Peter, and we'll stay with him for the uh, duration of the occultation. So, Peter, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. I've, I'm just going through and recording a few settings. I don't know if you saw the previous one. It was just um, recording of settings of um, th – this one I'm doing is the, is the GPS settings. Um, I've got nine satellites 
the, the signal strength um, is below one, which is really good. It gives my location and everything there, which is all right. Um, I'm in Roeville. So <laughs> this is the star, and they're merging at the moment, obviously merged. Liam's got a, um, um, a time Stop code watching. going that uh, synchronizes with um, um, an atomic clock. If I move it closer, and we've just checked the GPS time and the atomic time, and they're accurate. So right. we've now got um, exactly one minute before the event should start now, and oh, the middle oh, yeah. of the event should be at, at 22. So the time code we're seeing at the bottom of the screen here is, is u universal time. Right. Can I just say, I love the font. It reminds me of the old uh, VHS recorders with the, the, the fonts, of the, the text that they'd put up on screen. Now, we've drifted right up on the screen. I've, yeah. Hopefully it stays in. Is it uh, too late to recenter? Um, probably not. It's gonna, we're going to make it. All right. So how long is the event expected to last? How long will it take to pass in front of the star? Um, it's plus or minus four seconds, and it could be up to 11 seconds. Right. So, so up to 11 seconds with yeah, the, so, being the... So now, so, so eight, nine, so it should four be occurring seconds. now. Yeah. All right, here we go. Yes, that has dimmed, hasn't it? And... Oh, it's just on the edge. <laughs> It's going to be a problem. It should be brighter and we've drifted off. That's oh, going to be a problem for my analysis. So that's a big oh, shame. That is the issue when you're dealing with technology, isn't it? Yeah. Like things are going great until you need it to work. And then, then you've got to yeah. adapt. Yep, there it is. There it is. But that looks back to full brightness again, doesn't it? Well, that graph should definitely show ingress, shouldn't it? Maybe not egress. Yeah. The, so the, the drop, not the return. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see. And um, I'll, I'll communicate with Dean and, and find out from him to see what he... What he uh, observed. ...gets as well. So I'm going to... And when you get the opportunity, it would be wonderful if you could uh, get that graph prepared for us so we could all have a look at it before we finish up. Because I'm thinking I might finish up in the next 20 minutes or so. Maybe I'll okay. do one more target. Yep. All right. So, all right. folks, um, thank Peter for uh, allowing us to participate in that scientific uh, exercise. I thought it was very interesting. Thank um, you. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. And if, does anyone have any final requests of objects to have a look at? Maybe not any planets, uh, but see if there's any other deep sky objects that we could we could check out. And I think uh, my Mars has now finished as well, my recording of Mars, yes. So um, Tommy asks, uh, does Stellarium deal with the tracking when you change targets or does PhD automatically adjust itself? Uh, so... The, the mount actually takes care of the tracking. Uh, Stellarium is sort of like a front end of the mount. It's like a, an output. Uh, it views what the mount is currently doing. PhD is uh, an overlay on top of what the mount does. So with the camera watching the tracking star, the guiding star, it then sends periodic pulses to the mount to keep things up. So the mount does its own thing with the occasional input from PhD and it displays what it's doing in Stellarium. So you can just plug in the, the handset controller for the mount, uh, which is what you do if you're doing visual work and you're away from your computer. Um, and that would then have all the same functionality except it wouldn't do guiding. Uh, and you can control it by hand and it'll continue to track throughout the night. Um, the Stellarium just makes it easier because you can see where the telescope's pointing because it's giving the feedback to my computer. Um, and it's, uh, it means that I can tell the, the telescope where to point rather than using the hand controller, I can use my computer as an interface. Uh, M8 is well below the horizon. Uh, let me just see if M4 is up, and I think that might also be below the horizon. 
Um, one moment, please. We'll sort it by name because M made an M4 near the top. Uh, M4 is, yes, it's below my horizon, unfortunately. Um, perhaps you can tell me what sort of object you'd like to look at. We can't probably do any nebulae, but um, uh, Pleiades, no, Pleiades aren't up yet. They're in the northern sky uh, rising maybe in a couple of hours. Um, uh, let's see. I'll look through my list and see if there's anything that jumps out at me. We've done the uh, done the tarantula. Couldn't forget. Couldn't think of it for a second there. Uh, we've done the helix. Ah, maybe we can do a cluster of galaxies. The uh, the Grus Quartet uh, seven five eight two. Let's have a look at that. We'll go back to Stellarium. We can zoom back out from Mars. Uh, we, uh, yes, M NGC 55. Um, just wondering if the Grus Quartet would be more interesting. Tell you what, I'll do the Grus Quartet first and then we'll go over to NGC 55 and have a look at that as well because that is an interesting target for sure. Seven five eight two. All right, uh, where is that? It's not too close to the moon, but it's not too far either. But let's go and have a look. Ah, uh, the butterfly cluster. Let me see if that's up. M98. No, it's not up at the moment, I'm sorry. All right, so did we get to, to the Grus cluster? Okay, it's just arrived. Good timing. Swinging past a little bit and then coming back. Ah, okay, yes, yeah, one of the objects, but that's the one I was after. So we'll slew to that. Come on, why aren't you slewing? All right, let's just see what we've got. Actually, I'll just load the preset. That's quicker. Uh, Arona asks, would we have been able to see the occultation in Neil's telescope? Yes, you would have. However, uh, to do accurate occultation observations, you need to have some specialist uh, timing equipment to make sure that you are able to get things down to the millisecond accurate. Uh, I don't have that equipment, so while we would have been able to observe it, I wouldn't have been able to collect the scientific information that Peter uh, was able to do so. So it would have been nice to look at. Uh, maybe would have seen it a little bit closer than Peter's gear. Maybe not, um, but it wouldn't have been uh, fruitful from a scientific point of view. And uh, uh, Peter has all that all set up ready to go, so I wanted to show it on his screen. All right, so there's something there, something there, and something there, but also something down here. So I think we need to move it out to the right a little bit. And I need to turn it off. It's uh, 
15 second exposures in order to do that because there's no way I'll be able to do this accurately if it's only one frame every 15 seconds. So I think that's south. No, north. A little bit further. There we go. All right, we'll go back to our imaging setting. Come on, it's lagging again. There we go. And go back to a live stack. Tail incoming. <laughs> so reset those. Clear the previous exposure. Hang on. Why are we getting 250 milliseconds? Ah, because I think to click load on the preset. So we'll clear that again. And we should get our first frame in in a few seconds. <laughs> Tail alert, yes. <laughs> okay. So that color is obviously wrong. That's better. And let's do a quick auto stretch and see how that comes up. Oh, very, very nice. There we go. Uh, I might actually even move it further across, but you can see we've got one, two, three, four faint fuzzies there. They are all galaxies. How cool is that? All right, let's go back to our finding preset because I really want to center this a bit better. I forgot to click load again. <laughs> Uh, got it wrong again. There we go. All right, back to imaging preset. Load. Live stack. Clear. And we wait again. Uh, Goose is the crane, yes. We have uh, quite a few birds in our sky. We've got uh, Groose the Crane, Cygnus the Swan, um, I think it's Parvo the Peacock. Uh, I'm sure Jackie will be able to remember some others that I've forgotten. Um, but yes, this is amazing. Uh, to think that we are able in just 15 seconds to take a photo that shows four faint fuzzy blobs that are galaxies. And those galaxies are a long, long way away. Uh, let me just check in Stellarium. So the, the brightest one uh, looks like it's this one. So the one in the middle, so that's the, the furthest distance one, the two top ones and the one in the middle. Uh, let me see if it'll let me click on it. Uh, all right, I'm gonna have to just confirm which object that is. Uh, where is it in my list? I've got a couple of hundred items in my list, so it's a bit tricky to find it. Uh, Grease Quartet. Yes, that's the one. So that's NGC 7582. NGC 75. Uh, this is 79 million light years away for this galaxy. And these galaxies are all actually, they're not just coincidentally lined up, they're all actually near to each other. So they are probably, these ones are interacting. If you did really, really, really long exposures, you might see some rivers of stars between them because they're getting pulled towards each other. And this one is probably going to fall towards those ones as well. And they may eventually emerge in billions of years into a, a super galaxy, a, um, a, a very large um, irregular or elliptical galaxy. So uh, seven, 79 million light years. Uh, I said before, just as a reminder, a light year is 10 billion billion or 10 trillion kilometers. That's one light year. So 79 million times 10 billion billion kilometers. It's just way beyond what you can conceive. You can't even think about that. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> taking screenshots. Thank you very much. And I know you're the cheeky one. Don't try and pass them off as your own photos, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's go back and see how that image is coming together. All right, I can probably tweak that a little bit better now. Uh, I reckon I can do better than the auto settings. Now, the, the corners are obviously heavily vignetted, but I want to try and reduce the background a little bit. Oh, it's tricky. Again, these are faint objects and the moon is up. Uh, the moon has a, quite a significant impact on how these photos can look and how easy it is to process them. Um, that background glow that you can see is, is contributed to by the moon. So it's a little tricky. So let me just tweak the white balance a little bit. Too far. In between. That looks good. So let's zoom in and have a closer look. We'll go into 100%. And let's start down the bottom and have a look at this one out here. So here, all right, those of you who know, don't answer this, or not like you already knew, but based on what we talked about before, looking at the shape of this, what type of galaxy would this be? What category would it fall into? Uh, so answer now in the comments what would you call this style of galaxy with this kind of structure let's see what comes up damon says spiral close but not quite it is a spiral but it's a specific type of spiral Arona has the same guess. So you, you're both on the right track. There we go. A, oh, Kelly, you, you got the barred part, but you didn't get the spiral part. So Brett was the first one to get it right. It is a barred spiral. So you can see we've got a little tick of an arm coming off the side there and a very, very faint one coming off there and this fairly straight and dramatic bright bar running across between those two arms. So this is definitely a barred spiral. Let's go up and have a look at the other three. They might even fit all in the screen at the same time. Okay, we can get two of them in. These look to me to be uh, just regular spiral galaxies. It's possible that they're lenticular. A lenticular galaxy is a flat galaxy like a spiral, but it doesn't have arms. So if you can imagine what a spiral galaxy would look like, flat with a bulge in the middle, but without the arms, just the, the, the stars blended in together. That's a lenticular galaxy. Now, it's probably too hard to tell without getting a lot more data on this so that I can reduce the noise and increase the contrast and bring out some of the detail. These might be um, spiral galaxies. They might be lenticular. Let's zoom out a little bit, see if we can find the third one. There it is. Oh, now that's, that's the brightest one, the one that we first went to. And isn't that beautiful? You can really see a strong central core there. It's definitely a lenticular or spiral. You can see it's quite flat. In fact, if you sort of squint at it a little bit, you can really see that it's like a, a circular thing on its edge that we're looking across the edge. And I don't know, is that a little darker area there and maybe a darker area here that hints that there could be spiral arms in there? What do you think, folks? Do you reckon that's a spiral or a lenticular? I definitely want to return to this uh, group in the future and do a whole night of imaging on it. Um, I won't live stream that because that's really boring. Once I've set things up and it's recording, it will capture for the whole night and it will uh, just take the same image over and over and over, it looks like. Um, so when you stack them together, that's when you can get the results. But uh, it will allow me to, to get rid of most of that noise in the background and hopefully bring out some structure so I can actually see the shape of these galaxies and tell them apart if they're spiral, barred spiral or lenticular. All right, so we will stop on that target 
and I will save that one, but I wanted to do one more, which is a nice big galaxy. And when I say big, I mean the apparent size from our perspective. Uh, and we'll finish up after that. It was the one that Jackie suggested, uh, NGC 55. Now this is a, an unusual one. And we will go to it and have a look and you can tell me if you think it looks unusual. Uh, giving you a spoiler here, you can see a preview of it in the Installarium. Just don't expect my photo to look like that, okay? <laughs> uh, thank you for, for hanging on. I hope you've enjoyed yourself, Christine. I will be finishing up soon, but I really appreciate you staying around as long as you did. And everyone who has been here uh, for any time or especially for the whole time that we've been going. Thank you very much. I appreciate your support and your patience. And I, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Uh, Peter, while we're slewing across to the string of pearls, uh, have you had any progress on analyzing your data yet? Okay, I think I need to unmute you, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, you have muted yourself. You'll need to do that. There we go. Okay. That's better. Um, so I found so that I share the software, you, you can okay. share my screen. It's, uh, you can see the software that I'm using here. It's um, called Pi Movie. Um, I've actually just run it and done an update because I know that I can use smaller boxes to, um, uh, that'll go, to use when I select the star and um, but I've, what I've found is I ran through it before and it when those boxes hit the edge of the the um, field that it stops moving and the star continues to drift off so um, I'm just about to run another uh, while you do that through. I, um, I because it's that. moved all the way across the meridian it didn't find the galaxy in the first attempt so I'm going to just quickly do a, um, a search for it while you uh, continue your chat. So carry on. Aki, I need that microphone. Thank you. So what are we looking at now, Peter? All right. So I'm just setting the – there's a way – so this is the target here. I am, I'm setting the target, and you can see down below um, there's a field that um, in this square here it reads all the, the number of pixels that are lit up and records them. Over in this screen here, it actually, um, this is where it measures all the signal that it's receiving and, 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 and um, does all the calculations. Um, I know the new version, there's a, I can set the size of this square. Have I come to a little bit early? Yes. <laughs> I, know. I can't. I was told about it the other day, and it's a new function that's been added into this software. So I can't remember where it is. So you can. Uh, uh, I'm still trying to center my target. So uh, folks can be uh, just a. a be patient a little bit. <laughs> Astronomy is all about patience. Uh, so hopefully uh, Peter or I will get to something cool very soon.
<laughs> Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> What's Stuart say? The race is on. No pressure. <laughs> Let's see who gets to something how, first. How many people are watching? Uh, we've got 88 now. Okay. 88 diehards. Thank you to everyone who's still around. I'm just just going to try something. So am I. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble centering it. It's got to a point uh, where it sometimes does where the telescope doesn't want to move from where it thinks it should be, and it's not correct. So... <laughs> Uh, sorry to hear that you've been having some trouble, Janine. Uh, the Australian internet is diabolical, unfortunately. So um, I hope you're able to watch the replay uh, at your leisure. Um, and maybe you sometime your internet will be a bit more reliable. Fingers crossed. Uh, yes, Sean, that is a fantastic idea. Um, uh, it was just mentioned before by someone that uh, watching it on a mobile phone is frustrating because you can't see the images. Pardon me. Oh, don't you hate that? <laughs> um, but yes, watching it on the big screen TV would definitely be very satisfying. I can understand that. All right, I'm going to have to shut... All my apps down, disconnect the uh, telescope, and then start them up again. I think that'll get it back again. Keep forgetting to take comments off the screen. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> Mouse is running out of battery. It's jumping. Oh, uh, yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> we can look at the uh, the timestamps back later on, Stuart. <laughs> Hell yes, Belinda, I'll have pancakes. Are you offering? <laughs> Do you deliver? Uh, Kelly, that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that uh, you think the time has passed quickly. That's great. And uh, Peter, I won. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've centered my target now. So I will. Ow, Aki. He got annoyed at me that I wasn't feeding him and he gave me a nip. <laughs> All right. So I've centered my target. Let's see if I can get a quick image of it. And I shall bring the picture back over, uh, the screen back over to this one. All right, and we'll do a live stack. There we go. Not much. It's a bit of a uh, uh, an anticlimax, but this is just the first 15 second frame. And in fact, I think. I might go up to 60 second subs for this because I think that might help with faint objects. So we'll need to be a little bit more patient for this, but um, hopefully we'll get better results. I might be able to process it a little bit more clearly. 
Uh, good night, Brett. Thank you for coming by. I'm glad you've enjoyed yourself. I uh, hope you can join us again sometime. Uh, these streams happen pretty much impromptu, uh, partly because I don't know if my gear's going to work on any particular night, and I don't know if the weather's going to be cooperate. Uh, fortunately, tonight we've been very, very lucky. So um, keep an eye open on the NBO page, and you might see uh, some notifications pop up at the last minute for more of these, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. All right, here comes our first frame. We've got five seconds to go. I'm going to reset these stretches too so it doesn't look too terrible straight out of the bat. There we go. Okay, that does look terrible straight out of the bat. <laughs> so we'll do an auto stretch. Okay, there we go. Now, I think, again, the moon is affecting this. It is flooding everything with light, which makes it a lot harder to get much detail. Uh, and reducing the the noise, the grain. But um, it's worth a go because it's something you can show you. And uh, it's still fun, even if it doesn't look its best. So, all right. This is the very first shot. And you recall on my previous Galaxy shots, it takes a little time to, to get enough data, enough exposures to um, make it look its best or even make it look uh halfway decent so we'll just be patient with this for a little bit longer and see what uh what we come up with in the meantime the 78 diehards who are still here do you have any questions uh, this is a good time for me to answer them while we get some imaging some data I wonder, can I rotate this image as I view it rather than rotating the camera? Hmm. Perhaps not. Just because uh, the galaxy is fairly vertical and the view is fairly horizontal. So I was wondering if I'd be able to fit it in a bit better, but that's okay. Uh, Marlene is just listening with her eyes closed now. Well, um, you are missing out on seeing the images, but uh, I hope that that's uh, relaxing for you. Uh, I hope my voice is, is helping you put, put you to sleep. Uh, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> you are getting sleepy, sleepy. <laughs> oh, that wasn't too creepy. Blender. That's a big fat yet. Yes. Big fat yes. Pineapple does go on pizza. Not all pizzas, but definitely some pizzas. Madeline asks, how did Aki get his name? It's Japanese and it means autumn. And that is when uh, I adopted Aki. So uh, I like Japanese culture and so that inspired the name. Uh, Adam asks, just wondering where we are at on the status of Belinda's pancakes. You know, you'll have to check in with her. Uh, I haven't had the doorbell ring yet, so no updates there from me. Uh, Milane needs to stay till the end, fear of missing out. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> uh, Vinod asks, am I using any filters? Not on this camera. Uh, this is a one-shot color camera, so it gets all its data in a single exposure. Uh, I do also have a mono camera, which was actually the one hooked up with the, uh, the external view of the telescope. And I use filters for that one, but I wasn't tonight because uh, I was just getting a black and white image of the outside. Um, Arky needs his food. Yeah, he does, but he'll get his snack after we're finished here, which will probably be in about five or 10 more minutes. Uh, Joy says, NBO, Neil and Peter, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Well worth it for this old girl to stay up at good night. I'm glad you've enjoyed yourself, Joy. Uh, thank you very much for coming along. Um, and we might see you again in the future. Uh, Diana, is this a spiral you are looking at now or is it called something else? Well, Pitt. Now, 
I did mention earlier that this is there's something special about this galaxy or different. It's unusual uh, in that it it might have been a galaxy once, uh, sorry, a spiral galaxy once, but it's a bit misshapen now, and it's probably what we would call an irregular galaxy. Uh, it has a weird shape that is probably the result of uh, interactions with another nearby galaxy, or maybe it is the result of a merger of two galaxies. You can see here that we, we definitely have a core, but it's very asymmetrical. On this side, it's getting lost a bit in the, the glow from the moon and the haze in the background, but this side, it seems to be quite faint and short. But out here, it's wider, fainter, and longer. That is not how spiral galaxies typically look but it is still flat. So it's it's an unusual one. Uh, it's a bit hard to really define it. I think most astronomers would refer to it as an irregular galaxy, unless there's a spiral structure that I can't see um, in this photo so far. So well picked. Uh, now, one of the great things about being uh, the host here is that I can choose which comments I put up on the screen so I am going to put all the comments from people that say yes for pineapple and none of the comments for people that say no. <laughs> this is a democracy. <laughs> Who else has said yes? Uh, we only had the three. Well, still, that's better than none. Uh, Damon asks a very pertinent question. Tell us a bit about MBO membership, the good start stuff apart from supporting MBO. Well, while we're in lockdown, there we are a bit limited to what we can do with our members, but we have uh, a Facebook group for members only. So that's where people can chat about what they're up to and what, what they're doing. It's a sort of a social group. Uh, we don't do outreach there. We do that mostly through this page, um, but it's a place where you can get to know each other and hang out. Uh, we are also, of course, doing our regular live streams once a month for the night at the observatory and uh, whenever the opportunity presents itself for these, but that's for the public. Members, however, we get a, a weekly members night and that is live streamed currently and members get to, uh, we usually have a, a speaker presenting a topic of some sort each week. Uh, our most recent one was a talk by uh, our very own Stuart, who is in the chat at the moment answering questions. Um, and he gave us a talk on uh, gravity and how it works um, specifically with orbits and how uh, things in space interact with each other. It was a very fascinating uh, talk. Stuart has a knack for taking complex, complex mathematical uh, theories and questions and making them accessible. Um, it was a, an intellectually stimulating talk. Uh, and that was for members only. And we've had lots of other fascinating talks on various topics. Uh, not all hardcore mathematics. Some of them have been things like, uh, you know, how to take photos of the night sky, um, things about activities to do with kids that are astronomy related. Um, so all sorts of stuff like that. But when we can go back to the observatory again, uh, we have our weekly members nights, but they happen on site uh, in the log cabin, uh, which is next to the observatory. People bring along cakes and biscuits. Uh, we have speakers and we can socialize in person. Also, if it's clear, we have about half a dozen telescopes um, that, well, even more than that, that people can get out and have a look through, uh, ranging from eight inch Dobsonian telescopes, which are relatively small and what we would recommend for most beginners, uh, up to uh, an 18 inch uh, Dobsonian telescope, which is, again, it's a fairly easy one to use. It's just up, down, left, right. You push it around, but it's huge. So you can really see faint details on some of these uh, nebulae and galaxies. Uh, we also have the uh, original Monash Dome telescope, the one installed by Monash University. That is a bit outdated and it's not suited for all targets, but it's great for things like planets and bright nebulae. So it's very popular with uh, the public who come up and look at things. And of course, we have the Celestron Dome, which is our new observatory dome, uh, constructed a couple of years ago and has a brand new robotic telescope in there, a 14 inch Smith Cassegrain. And that observatory is available to members only. 
uh, you can either um, ask a member who has training on it to uh, let you see through it or put your camera on it. Or if you're very keen, you can get the training yourself and uh, drive it all by yourself. Uh, of course, though, it does mean that if you have the training that you may be asked to show members who don't have the training through the telescope. In addition to that, we have uh, a library. Uh, we have special interest groups. So we've got astrophotography, astro arts, radio astronomy, uh, outreach, and uh, a special section for juniors as well. Uh, and each of those groups do activities throughout the year, um, including our members nights, public viewing nights, and uh, section activities. We have over 80 events each year. So more than one a week, there's lots going on. Um, and I could go on. There's lots of cool stuff. And not to mention, of course, all the wonderful people up there. Uh, it's a really fantastic community of uh, like-minded people who enjoy sharing their passion for the night sky and space. So um, a very long rant, but I think you can see that uh, MBO has a lot to offer and we uh, I'm very passionate about it. I think uh, we're a wonderful group and it's really wonderful to be part of. So. If that has convinced you that you would like to become a member, you can go to our website, nbo.org.au slash membership, and you can uh, become a member there. Um, just another, uh, as an aside for folks who are still here before I finish up, which I will do shortly, um, if you would like to see more from me and follow my work, uh, you can have a look at the uh, the gallery that uh, was posted, the link was posted earlier. But when I do most of my uh, my work, I post it first to my Facebook profile. Uh, I have a Facebook page, but I don't use that because the reach is horrendous. So I don't accept friend requests from people I don't know. Uh, thank you for understanding that. But I do uh, allow people to follow me. So if you want to go to my profile, it's facebook.com slash Neil Creek. You can see my name on the screen there for the spelling. Um, feel free to follow me. That allows you to see all public posts that I make and the vast majority of the posts that I do are public. Uh, so you'll see lots of pictures of my cat. You'll see things that I do other than astronomy, of course. Um, but that's usually where I share what I'm up to with my photography and astronomy first. So. If you're interested in me and my work personally, uh, that's where you can uh, find me on social media uh, most active. Um, Peter, do you have any website or information that you'd like to share since we've got people here? Yeah. Um, no, I can't think of anything at the moment, but I was just thinking, boy, you can... Uh, you, I can talk. ...know how to talk about things and explain things quite well. I'm oh, just so about at a point where... Um, as, oh, shall I, as far as I can go. Sorry, Neil. Shall I share your screen? Yep, you can share the screen. Terrific. Um, this is the final analysis here. I don't think you're going to be able to see all these numbers ticking over. Um, I was able to reduce the size of the apertures that are measuring the light. It's going to stop in a tick, but um, we should have seen the drop. Now, um, Dean's reported to me that it's about um, uh, three or four seconds late, but we should see the drop. Now, once... Interesting. So it did happen exactly when predicted. In fact, it was at the edge of the window. Um, it was four seconds, wasn't it? It, uh, it was predicted to be uh, plus or minus four seconds and 11 seconds long. All right, and I think. What did you observe? Is it still there? Okay, I'm going to pull, stop it there. Now, we're just plotting the graphs. Oh, wow. That's quite distinct, isn't it? All right, so this, don't. Uh, so the red one is actually our target. Yep. No, the, the blue one's our target. That's what I would have thought, looking at the... Our the red top. one is our track. And the green one's the reference. So... 
So we did see it drop off before you lost yeah. it over the end of the game. So That's there's fantastic. a two-step drop-off here. Oh, that's interesting. So what would that tell us? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's um, Could it be telling us something you know, about yeah, the It could be a bit of an odd shape. Um, the other thing, it's possible that it was actually a double star. Oh, wow. Now, to confirm that, I have to have a look at um, and, and communicate with Dean to see if he has the same thing. Okay, so, folks, just to help you understand what we're talking about here, this is not uh, a, a confirmed observation, but far from it. No. However, what Peter has observed, um, you can see the blue line, it drops off and then it plateaus for an instant, then it drops off again. Now, that could indicate that there is more than one star in this system, and one of them is brighter than the other. And so when the asteroid passed in front of it, it blocked the light from one star and then proceeded to block the light from the other star. Now, if that observation is confirmed from other sources and that star was not previously known to be a double star, then Peter and whoever else contributed to the observations have discovered a double star. And this is, uh, Peter is an amateur. I mean, this is his job. It, there are other things. It, it, it's a possibility. If it was a, um, there's an activity that um, they do with lunar occultations to detect double stars. Yep. And um, that's the bump that they look for, that type of thing. Well, that's very exciting. I know it's, it's, very much speculation at the moment but wouldn't that be cool if you could say that you've contributed to science by helping discover the existence of a double star that wasn't known about previously and you might have seen it here live folks <laughs> yeah another application should have fired up in the background oh, we'll say no to that yeah, you can clearly see there the two-step drop in yep. brightness, can't you? So. Now I have to go back and double-check something here. I just have to put Justine's comment on screen because absolutely, oh, yeah. this is what it's all <laughs> about. Having... Uh, a contribution to science as an amateur with gear that you can just buy off the shelf. It's so exciting. Astronomy is one of the very few sciences that are around where you can still contribute to expanding the knowledge of humanity as an amateur. So if that's something that excites you, uh, as you can see, we have members at MBO doing that. So if you would love to be able to contribute to science, you don't have the time to go through a, a university degree and you have a, um, you know, no opportunity to go off and study at an observatory. This is something that you can do at home with equipment that you can purchase off the shelf and actually have your name added to the, the annals of history, potentially. So, Neil, the other thing at, I, I'm realising right now, um, oops, I've lost the... Um... Now, just because I've been waxing lyrical about this, it doesn't mean that this is something new. It no, no. Something the, the star ran off the edge of the screen and it could have been, I could have not stopped the analysis before it went off the edge. All oh, right. So I'm just re realising that at the moment. Now that... Where do I... Still, the potential is there for this sort of work to be able to make those sorts of discoveries. No. Let me reopen. Um, Neil, how do you see the chat? 
Um, do you have you've got with, Facebook open? No, no. With the um, the Streamyard interface on the right hand side, you've got a column there. Uh, I think you might be able to see two tabs at the top of the column, one for oh, no. like, and one for others. Yeah, so you can see that there. Yeah, I've got it now. Thanks. Right. Yep. You've had lots of people um, very excited on your behalf about the potential. <laughs> yeah, I was in. Obviously, I was in the private chat. I didn't look at that. Yeah. All right. I'm just having a little bit of a tweak with the uh, yeah. the last of the data that I've got for. So, uh, so, so to confirm this, I'm going to have to run it again and and um, uh, do a bit more analysis and also communicate with Dean and confirm. So um, normally, uh, to income, if I. I can All right, well, I might um, finish it off here. But just before we go, uh, is there anything you wanted to, to show in particular, Peter, that we're, um, you're ready to go with? That I was just running that to, to see if it will mark, mark the D. There's a couple of other graphs that come up with this software and then that goes into the report. Um, some information that just popped up down here. Uh, you can hide that in notification if you want, by the way. Oh, okay. Um, that gets reported and um, and it goes to the regional director of um, that uploads this data. Into well, the, if, you, uh, if you hear any news back on that, please share yep. it with us. I'd like sure. to pass it on to everyone. I think the information that I've got is... Um, because it runs off the screen and I don't have the return, it's probably not going to be used and it'll be dismissed. Yep. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, but this is science. Science uh, is about pushing through errors, uh, being uh, cautious and not jumping to conclusions, uh, which I love to do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Peter being very suitably uh, cautious about uh, what he's expecting to see. But um, this is something that Peter loves doing and he's going to continue to do. So even if this result doesn't turn out to be anything special, uh, I'm sure that sooner or later, somewhere down the line, Peter's going to be able to make some genuine contributions to science if he hasn't already with some of the work he's done previously. All right, I'm going to take us back to my screen for just a, a little bit longer. Uh, just show you a final view of uh, NGC 55, which is proving to be a real pain in the neck to process. But again, I think that is because of the moon. Uh, I'm struggling to get the color right and to get much detail out of it. But you can see here that we've got uh, much more than we did in the first few seconds of exposure. If I zoom into about 50%, you can really see we've got some structure going on here. We've got a couple of little star clusters here that are actually clusters in that galaxy. So they're big enough and bright enough that we can see them in our galaxy tens of millions of light years away. We can also see some dark mottling through here. They are dark clouds of gas and dust blocking the light from behind um, the stars further deep in the galaxy. Uh, looking out here into this lobe that continues all the way up there, you can still see even more clusters uh, of stars. And that would suggest that there is star formation occurring. Um, most star clusters are young stars. Things are constantly in motion in the universe. And so as the uh, clusters move around through the galaxy as they, they age, uh, they interact with other stars and they tend to drift apart. The, the stars within them get all mixed up. So the fact that there are still clusters there means that the stars were born not too long ago. And if this galaxy is the result of a galactic collision, a merger of two galaxies, then star formation is generally what you see as a result of that. Because there's a lot of uh, movement and commotion and things getting stirred up, it causes shock waves to pass through the clouds of gas and dust in those galaxies. That compresses some of that gas and dust 
and that can trigger the beginnings of um, a star forming because that compressed gas and dust comes together in enough density to cause it to attract other gas and dust, causing the positive feedback loop that brings all the, the, um, the dust in their region together to form a new star. And so you get these bursts of stellar formation where these um, uh, shock waves come together and concentrate the dust. So just by this little crappy, blurry, you know, noisy image of this weird looking galaxy, we can tell quite a bit about it just from looking at uh, its shape, uh, what's in it, and um, and various details about it like that. So there is a lot to learn uh, in astronomy. And even though I'm not contributing to science by doing this, I'm learning it myself from my own experience. Um, you, you might see conspiracy theorists that say that, you know, you can't prove that the earth isn't flat. You can't prove that men walked on the moon. You can't prove that those galaxies are really all the way out there. Well, yeah, you can. You can see it with your own eyes. Uh, this isn't me loading images off Google. If I did, there'd be much better quality than this. And this isn't sticking, you know, cardboard cutouts of galaxies on the end of my telescope. I'm actually taking these images. Um, this is something you can do with your, uh, you know, with amateur equipment. Just need a bit of time, a bit of money, and a bit of patience to learn how it all works. So I am going to call it a night there. Uh, we've been going for almost two and a half hours. So yes, once again, we went for a long time. Thank you to everyone who stuck around. 65 of you are still here. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter, also for joining me and giving us a wonderful you. live demonstration of science. It was terrific to see that occultation. Um, Stuart, thank that's you. a wonderful thing. So thank you. Stuart says that I'm contributing to science by inspiring others right now. And I really hope that's true. I would love to be able to inspire people to uh, get into science, maybe take it up in uh, as a, um, a study, go to university, uh, you know, pursue your love of, of astronomy and science and turn it into a career. That would be amazing. Um, but it's been wonderful hanging around with you all tonight. I had a great time. I look forward to doing it again next time. And thank you so much, everyone, and I will see you again soon. Take care, stay safe, and watch the skies. Good night. Good night.